Fishing was in my blood. Generations of navigating choppy waters, mending nets, and hauling catches. The sea was both my livelihood and my sanctuary, a realm of endless horizons and hidden depths. But that night, as we sailed under the cover of darkness, the ocean revealed a side I had never seen, nor ever wished to see again. We cast our nets like we had a thousand times before. As they sank, we adjusted our sonar, scanning for schools of fish. But something else caught my eye, an unidentified object hovering near the ocean floor. It was too symmetrical, too stationary to be a school of fish or debris. My gaze shifted between the sonar and the inky sea, curiosity edging into apprehension. A murmur of uncertainty rippled among the crew. Our eyes were locked on the depths below when it happened. A surge of luminescence emanated from the object, casting bright beams that sliced through the darkness like celestial spotlights. The ship trembled as if jarred by an invisible hand. Our sonar scrambled, then blinked out. We peered into the water, where the source of the light remained elusive, but its effects were undeniable. Around us, the ocean started to bubble, as if reaching a rolling boil. I touched the surface with my hand. It was unnaturally warm, like bath water. What came next was the most haunting of all. Fish, by the hundreds, floated to the surface, lifeless. Their scales shimmered in the unsettling light, their eyes vacant. The crew was paralyzed, transfixed by the spectacle, as if witnessing an arcane ritual for which we were never meant to be the audience. The boiling ceased and the waters grew still. The object, whatever it was, started to ascend, its lights dimming as it moved. With a final pulse, it shot upwards, piercing the water's surface and soaring into the sky at a speed that defied comprehension. We were left in a deafening silence, surrounded by the aftermath of unexplained phenomena and inexplicable deaths. I restarted the sonar. It flickered back to life, revealing an empty stretch of seafloor, as if the object had never existed. We decided, unanimously and without discussion, to cut our expedition short. We hauled in our nets, now carrying a grim cargo of dead fish, and set course for home. As we sailed back, the lighthouse guiding us through the dark felt different, as if its beam were now too shallow to reach the places we had glimpsed. That night remains etched in our minds, a haunting intersection between the known and the unknown. We return to fishing because it's what we do, but something has shifted. We cast our nets with a heightened awareness of what lies beneath, of the mysteries that dwell in the ocean's depths. Conversations on the ship have a new undertone, a recognition that the sea, our lifelong companion, harbors secrets beyond our grasp, realms that defy our maps and challenge our dominion. And in the rare moments when our sonar detects something unusual, when an unexplained warmth graces the waters, or a strange light flickers in the distance, we find ourselves glancing skyward, pondering the true expanse of our world and the mysteries that lurk beneath its surface. The energy of Mardi Gras in New Orleans was intoxicating. The streets bustled with revelers. Jazz music filled the air, and the vivid colors of costumes and floats were a feast for the eyes. Amidst the celebrations, I found myself wandering down a less trodden path, drawn to the allure of a dimly lit curiosity shop. The shop was a treasure trove of artifacts, each with its own story, but my attention was captured by a mask hanging on the wall. It was beautiful yet haunting, a depiction of an old voodoo queen, with intricate beadwork and feathers, its eyes vacant yet compelling. A shiver ran down my spine as I tried it on. The world around me blurred, 
and I was thrust into a vision of a different era. The streets of New Orleans were still familiar, but the buildings were older, the people dressed in 19th century attire. I stood in a crowded market square, where a woman, regal and commanding, led a ritual. Her voice, powerful and melodious, chanted incantations as the crowd swayed, lost in a trance. It was the voodoo queen, and I was witnessing her in her prime, a pillar of strength and mysticism in the community. The vision shifted. I saw snippets of her life, intimate ceremonies in hidden bayous, healing the sick with herbs and potions, and guiding the lost with her spiritual insights. As suddenly as it began, the vision ended, I was back in the curiosity shop, the weight of the mask pressing against my face. I carefully removed it, my hands trembling. The shopkeeper, an elderly woman with knowing eyes, approached. You've seen her, haven't you? She whispered. I nodded, still processing the experience. Who was she? That mask belonged to Marie, a revered voodoo queen from centuries ago, she explained. It's said that those who wear the mask are granted a glimpse into her world. With a mix of awe and trepidation, I decided to purchase the mask. It was more than just a relic. It was a portal to a bygone era, a testament to the enduring spirit of the voodoo queen and the rich tapestry of New Orleans history. As an ER nurse, I've seen my fair share of strange things during the graveyard shift, but nothing prepared me for the night that I saw the ghost of a young child wandering the halls of our pediatric ward. It started like any other night, busy and chaotic. We had a bad car accident come in, so all hands were on deck in the ER. Once things finally calmed down around 3 a.m., I decided to stretch my legs and grab a coffee upstairs. That's when I saw him. A young boy, no more than six or seven, peeking his head around the corner at the end of the long hall. He had this lost, forlorn look on his face that struck me as odd. Quietly, I called out, Hey there, are you lost? But he didn't respond. He only stared back with sad eyes before disappearing around the corner. I hurried after him, turning the corner only to find the hallway completely empty. A chill went down my spine. There's no way he could have gotten out of there that fast. I searched every room, every nook and cranny of that ward looking for the boy, but he was nowhere to be found. When I told the other nurses what I had seen, they just nodded. It turns out several of them had seen this ghostly boy over the years, always wandering the halls late at night. We now think he's the spirit of a child who passed away here long ago, still drawn to the pediatric ward where he spent his final days. Though the encounter spooked me at first, I now find it kind of comforting to think that he finds some solace in visiting the kids, like he's watching over them, even from beyond. So, if you ever find yourself in the pediatric ward late at night and see a lone boy wandering the halls, don't be afraid. Just know that he's one of our own, and he means no harm. Oasis Medical Center wasn't a place anyone would mistake for a retreat, despite its name. It was an old, rundown hospital built in the 60s, with updates so infrequent it was like stepping back in time. But a paycheck is a paycheck, and you take work where you can find it. I was an IT specialist by day, a position that often had me walking the endless maze of hallways to fix computers and other electronic equipment. The medical staff appreciated me, and I didn't mind the work, until I started noticing the faces. 
The first time it happened, I was installing a software update on one of the heart rate monitors in room 417. Leaning over, I glanced at the screen, waiting for the loading bar to fill. And there, reflected in the glass, was a face. Not my face, mind you, but a face I didn't recognize. Old, sunken eyes, hollow cheeks. A man, or what used to be one. I spun around. The room was empty, except for the patient, an elderly woman asleep in her bed. The hairs on my arms stood up. But I told myself it was just stress, lack of sleep, whatever. I shook it off and finished the update. The next time, I was in the surgical ward, calibrating a piece of equipment I couldn't even pronounce. I bent down to adjust a dial when I saw another face in the reflective surface of the metal tray next to me. A young girl this time, with eyes too big for her face, staring at me like I had done something wrong. I jerked back, my heart pounding against my ribs. A nurse walked by, glancing curiously at me. You okay? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine, I muttered, doubting the words even as I said them. This started happening more frequently. Faces in computer monitors, faces in the glass panels of medicine cabinets, faces in the reflective surfaces of surgical tools, always when I was alone, always when I least expected it. And always different. Men, women, young, old, eyes full of sadness, anger, or accusation. I couldn't ignore it any longer. I started digging through old hospital records, scouring news articles online, anything to give me some insight. What I found sent a chill down my spine. Over the years, Oasis Medical Center had an unusually high number of unexplained deaths. Patients who passed away under mysterious circumstances, with causes of death listed as inconclusive. Were these the faces I was seeing? Spirits trapped in the hospital, bound to the place where they had met their untimely end? I took my findings to management, but they dismissed me, saying that it was all hearsay and coincidences. They even hinted that if I kept it up, I would be let go. So I shut up, but I didn't stop looking. I was transferred to the night shift. Less staff, fewer questions. I spent my nights walking the dark halls, my ears straining for sounds, my eyes narrowed in concentration. I took to carrying a small pocket mirror, taking it out to glimpse reflections when I felt I was being watched. And that's when I saw her, the young girl, the one I'd seen in the surgical ward, reflected in my pocket mirror. She looked at me and pointed behind me. I turned around and there, on the computer monitor, was a series of numbers. Medical records, a date, I didn't know. I documented everything, started putting pieces together, dates matching records and news articles. It was like a grim puzzle, each face corresponding to an unexplained death, each one a silent scream, a plea for justice. But what could I do? I was no detective, no avenger of spirits. Even now, as I sit in my makeshift office, surrounded by equipment that should be devoid of anything supernatural, I know I'm not alone. The faces are still there, glimpses in the glass, flickers on the screen. Are they asking me for my help or warning me? I don't know. All I know is that I can't escape them. Even as I write this, a reflection not my own stares back at me from the monitor's glass. It watches me, studies me, and for a brief moment, I swear it smiles. So I'm left with a choice. Dig deeper, risk my job, my sanity, to give these lost souls a voice? Or turn away, leave the hospital, and hope that the faces in the glass are bound to this place and not me. Each night, as I clock in and walk the dim corridors, I can't shake the feeling that my decision is no longer just about me. And in every reflection, I see eyes, watching, waiting. 
wondering what I'm going to do next. I had always prided myself on being rational, even keeled. You have to be when you're a maintenance technician in a sprawling facility like St. Augustine's Hospital. You troubleshoot electrical issues, fix leaky pipes, and ignore whatever local legends float around the place, except for the unexplained breezes in the West Wing. When I mentioned the cold drafts to Carol, the senior nurse who'd been at St. Augustine's since the days of dial-up internet, she leaned in. Oh, yeah. They come and go. You get used to it. That was easier said than done. The West Wing had been closed off for years, a relic of older, less efficient designs. Budget cuts, someone had mumbled once, but who knows. Despite its emptiness, it was my responsibility to make periodic checks for structural issues, leaks, and electrical faults. The first time I felt the breeze, I was at the end of one of those routine checks. My hand was on the door, ready to leave the derelict wing when it happened. An inexplicable blast of cold air hit me, snaking its way down my collar, chilling me to the bone. The air was still, windows were bolted shut, doors sealed. There was no rational explanation for it. I tried to dismiss it, to chalk it up as one of those quirks old buildings have. But then it happened again, and each time the breeze seemed to last longer, to feel colder. It became a distracting, unsettling mystery that I couldn't ignore. I even pulled up old blueprints of the hospital, trying to find some architectural explanation. Air shafts, hidden vents, anything. I found none. Determined to solve the puzzle, I decided to stay overnight in the West Wing. If there was a pattern to the chill winds, I was going to find it. Armed with thermal sensors and a high-definition camera, I set up my equipment in the center of the wing. The night stretched on, endless and uneventful, until about 3 a.m. Just as I was questioning my own sanity for doing this, the temperature readings on my thermal sensor plummeted. A chill wind, stronger than any before, howled through the corridor. Papers scattered, old window blinds clattered against the walls, and I was engulfed in a cold unlike anything I had ever felt. I grabbed my camera, fingers trembling, and scanned the room. But there was nothing, no visible source, just the icy gusts battering against me, as if pushing me away, out of the wing. When the winds finally ceased, I was left standing there, disoriented and chilled to my core. The thermal sensors normalized, but I couldn't shake off the feeling that I had trespassed into something I didn't understand. I packed up my equipment, my movements robotic. I couldn't wait to leave, but as I reached the door to the exit, I hesitated. My camera lay on the table, its lens staring back at me. I played back the footage, fast forwarding through hours of nothingness, until I reached the moment when the winds began. There it was, the papers scattering, the blinds clattering, and then I saw it, a shadow, fleeting and barely discernible, moving against the current of the wind, not with it. It was as if something had walked through, passed by me, unnoticed and undisturbed by the laws of physics. I never spoke of it, never showed anyone the footage. What could I say? What rational explanation could I offer? But I knew I couldn't go back to that wing, not alone, maybe not ever. Months passed and the West Wing became a distant concern, buried under the weight of more immediate issues. It became easier to ignore, easier to forget. But the air in the hospital changed, sometimes subtly, sometimes noticeably. A cold draft would pass through a crowded hallway, or a sudden chill would fill a warm room. Nurses blamed the air conditioning and doctors shrugged it off. 
only I knew that something had left the West Wing, something that defied explanation. And while the icy winds in the derelict wing had ceased, they now seemed to wander the hospital freely. I often find myself wondering where the chill will appear next, whether it's aimless or searching for something, something that perhaps only it understands. And so the hospital's pulse continues, now with a cold breath that reminds me that there are things in this world that remain beyond understanding, things that you can neither repair nor explain. The piercing shriek of a monitor alarm jolted me awake. I rushed down the hall to room 309, the source of the commotion. Rounding the corner, I saw the patient's heart monitor flashing a flat green line. Code blue, I called out. The rapid response team mobilized within seconds, crashing through the door prepared to resuscitate the patient. But as we entered, we found the patient sitting up in bed very much alive and very confused, breathing normally. He looked at us bewildered as his monitor continued to show no heart rhythm. Well, what's this all about? He asked hoarsely. The doctor quickly checked his pulse and found it steady. No CPR needed. After a manual reset, the monitor returned to normal. False alarm. Later at the nurse's station, we marveled at the bizarre malfunction but I knew better after hearing similar stories. Room 309's spiritual tenant wanted to test our response time. We passed this supernatural drill with flying colors. My heart still racing from the adrenaline rush, I said a little prayer of thanks that our patient was unharmed. As long as I'm working here, our ghostly resident can set off all the false monitor alarms they want. I'll always be ready for anything, paranormal or otherwise. It was a slow night. Halfway into my graveyard shift as a security guard, I found myself slumped in my chair, sipping stale coffee and watching feeds from the security camera. Monitors flickered in a rhythmic cycle through different angles of the hospital. Corridors, waiting rooms, stairwells. The place was a labyrinth after dark, silent except for the hum of machinery. My eyes were getting heavy when I saw it. Camera 12, third floor corridor. A shadowy figure moved along the wall, elongated and indistinct. I blinked, rubbed my eyes. The figure remained, inching closer to the far end of the hallway where it intersected with another. I glanced at the clock, 3.07 a.m. Grabbing my flashlight and keys, I made my way to the third floor. Adrenaline cut through my drowsiness. Either somebody had breached security or I was chasing phantoms. The elevator dinged softly, doors sliding open. I stepped out, flicked on the flashlight, and swept the beam down the corridor. Nothing. I checked the adjacent hallways, even popped into a few rooms. No sign of an intruder. Yet the unsettling sensation of being observed washed over me. I shook it off and headed back to the control room, a rational part of me figuring it was a camera glitch or a trick of the light. Back at my desk, I rewound the footage. The shadowy figure reappeared at the same spot moving in the same direction, fading as it reached the hallway's end. No logical explanation came to mind. I logged the incident, noting the time and camera number, though omitting my eerie feelings. No need for people to question my sanity. In the nights that followed, I watched that corridor like a hawk. The figure never reappeared, but the memory lurked in the back of my mind, a puzzle with missing pieces. And though I still patrol the third floor, I do it with a quicker step, always reminding myself to breathe, 
especially when my flashlight casts long shadows on the wall. As an ICU nurse, I've witnessed many patients pass, but Tony's death stunned me in a way that I still can't explain. He was a beloved grandfather in his late 60s, on life support after a major stroke. His chances were slim, but the family held out hope. Late one night during my shift, Tony's monitors suddenly started alarms. He had gone into cardiac arrest. We immediately started CPR, but the chaotic noise faded into the background as I tried to focus. The doctor began asking Tony questions, trying to stimulate any remaining brain activity. Tony, can you hear me? If you can hear me, try to respond. To my shock, a weak voice croaked, Yes, doc, I'm still here. The doctor and I froze and looked at each other with wide eyes. The voice was clearly Tony's, but it was impossible. He had flatlined. Tony, are you in any pain? The doctor continued warily. Again, Tony's strained voice uttered, No, all the pain's gone now. My hands shook as I continued chest compressions. How was he speaking with no heart rhythm? Do you see anything around you, Tony? Any bright lights? asked the doctor. No lights, just peaceful darkness, Tony responded. His voice grew fainter with each word. It's all right, Doc. My time's done. And please tell my family I love them. Then silence. Ten minutes later, we finally ceased efforts and called his time of death. But the chill from hearing a dead man's voice never left me. I avoided mentioning the supernatural event in my report. Who would believe a patient conversed while flatlined? I questioned my own sanity, but deep down I know what I heard. Since that night, I've paid closer attention as patients slip away. A few times, I'm certain that I've made out faint whispers of loved ones' names or gasped prayers long after the vitals ceased, their voices like wisps of vapor untethered from their bodies. Somehow, in those final moments between life and whatever lies beyond, there's an uncanny communication that technology can't detect. The monitor may show a flatline, but the spirit still stirs. Perhaps we put too much faith in our tools, and not enough in forces unseen. There's so much about the human spirit that eludes even our most advanced science, all I know is that day, Tony spoke to us beyond the veil of life, through a means unknown. His fading words will forever resonate. Wherever his spirit traveled next, I hope he found the peace he sought. For now, I keep monitoring the screen, but listening beyond it as well, honoring the mysterious ways the dying may speak their last pieces, even after the ship of life has sailed. Some ports of call lie beyond the reach of our maps. We can only have faith in the journey. I've always been a deep sleeper, the kind who could sleep through thunderstorms and blaring alarms. So, when I began feeling unusually fatigued during the day, I decided to invest in a sleep tracker. The sleek wristband would monitor my sleep patterns, providing insights into the quality and duration of my rest. The first morning after wearing it, I eagerly checked the data. To my surprise, the tracker showed periods of wakefulness during the night, with a significant amount of activity around 3 a.m. According to the device, I had been up and walking around for nearly an hour. I brushed it off as a glitch, assuming the tracker needed calibration. But night after night, the pattern persisted. Each morning, the device showed me awake and active 
during the early hours, even though I had no recollection of ever leaving my bed. Curiosity turning to concern, I decided to set up a night vision camera in my bedroom. If I was indeed sleepwalking, I wanted to know. The next morning, I played back the footage with bated breath. The room was bathed in the soft green glow of the night vision. For the first few hours, all was still. But then, around 3 a.m., something startling occurred. I saw myself sit up, eyes wide open, but with a vacant stare. Slowly, I climbed out of bed and began to wander around the room, touching objects, pausing occasionally as if listening to something inaudible. After nearly an hour, I returned to bed, settling back into a deep sleep. The footage was unsettling. My sleepwalking self moved with a deliberateness that was eerie, displaying behaviors and mannerisms I didn't recognize. Determined to get to the bottom of this, I consulted a sleep specialist. He diagnosed me with somnambulism, a sleep disorder that results in episodes of walking or performing complex tasks while asleep. Stress, he said, was a common trigger, but there was something he couldn't explain. During one of our sessions, I mentioned the way I'd pause during my nocturnal wanderings, as if listening to someone. Intrigued, he suggested an experiment. We would conduct an overnight observation, using sensitive audio equipment to pick up any sounds that might be occurring during my episodes. The results were chilling. During one of my sleepwalking episodes, the microphones picked up faint whispers, too soft to be discernible, but unmistakably human. The doctor was baffled, unable to provide a logical explanation. Returning home, I decided to delve into the history of my house. A deep dive into local archives revealed a tragic tale. A century ago, a young woman named Clara had lived in the house. She had been known to converse with unseen friends, often wandering the house at night whispering secrets into the dark. One fateful evening, she disappeared, never to be seen again. The parallels were uncanny. Was I tapping into some residual energy, reliving Clara's nocturnal conversations? Was she the source of the whispers? Seeking closure, I reached out to a medium. She conducted a seance, attempting to communicate with any spirits present. As the candles flickered, she made contact with Clara, who revealed her loneliness and desire for companionship. My sleepwalking episodes, it seemed, were a way for her to connect, to relive her nightly wanderings. The medium helped guide Clara to find peace, releasing her from the confines of the house. That night, for the first time in weeks, my sleep tracker showed a full, uninterrupted night of rest. The experience left me with a profound sense of wonder and respect for the mysteries of the universe. It was a reminder that sometimes the lines between the past and the present, the living and the dead, are more intertwined than we could ever imagine. As I explored my new home, I stumbled upon a small room that seemed to be a child's bedroom. Time had left its mark, with peeling wallpaper and creaky floorboards. But what caught my attention was an old porcelain doll sitting on a rocking chair. She wore a faded blue dress, her hair neatly tied in a bun, and her glassy eyes seemed to gleam with an inner light. A small name tag around her neck read, Evelyn. There was something unsettling about those eyes. No matter where I moved in the room, it felt as if they were following me, watching my every move. I tried to shake off the feeling, attributing it to the stress of the move and my overactive imagination. Over the next few days, as I settled into the house, I couldn't shake off the feeling of being watched. Every time I passed the room, I'd glance in, and there she'd be. Miss Evelyn, her gaze fixed on me. One evening, to test my sanity, I turned the doll to face the window and left the room. 
But the next morning, she was back in her original position, her eyes locked onto the doorway. Curiosity piqued, I decided to research the history of the house. At the local library, I found old newspaper clippings and records. The house had once belonged to the Whitmore family. They had a daughter, Evelyn, who tragically died at a young age. Devastated by the loss, her mother had commissioned a doll to be made in Evelyn's likeness, hoping it would provide some solace. The more I delved into the history, the more I began to connect the dots. Residents after the Whitmores reported strange occurrences, items moving on their own, soft giggles in the night, and the ever-present feeling of being watched. One evening, as I sat in the living room, I heard a soft humming coming from the direction of the child's room. I cautiously approached, the door creaking open to reveal Miss Evelyn, rocking gently in her chair, the room bathed in a soft, ethereal glow. Taking a deep breath, I addressed her. Evelyn, is that you? The room grew colder, and the doll's eyes seemed to shimmer. A soft voice, almost a whisper, replied, I'm lonely. Tears filled my eyes as I realized the truth. Evelyn's spirit was trapped, bound to the doll, longing for companionship and the life she never got to live. Determined to help, I reached out to a local medium. She conducted a seance, communicating with Evelyn's spirit. Through her, Evelyn conveyed her desire to be free, to move on and be reunited with her family. The medium performed a ritual, releasing Evelyn's spirit from the doll and helping her cross over to the other side. The atmosphere in the house immediately felt lighter. The oppressive weight of sadness lifted. Miss Evelyn, the doll, remained in the house, but her eyes no longer followed me. She sat in her rocking chair, a silent witness to the history of the house and the little girl who once called it home. I often think of Evelyn and hope that she found peace. Her doll serves as a reminder of the mysteries of the unknown and the thin line between the living and the dead. Our family road trips were always filled with laughter, games, and of course music. My wife, Aisha, our two kids, Maya and Sami and I, were on a summer drive through the heart of Virginia, heading towards the Blue Ridge Mountains. The landscape was picturesque, with rolling hills and dense forests flanking the highway. As we drove, I decided to scan the local radio stations, hoping to find some classic rock or perhaps a catchy pop tune. But what we stumbled upon was something entirely unexpected. The radio tuned into a station, WVLR Memories 88.9, and a soft, melodic song began to play. The lyrics spoke of a summer romance at a county fair, of stolen glances atop a Ferris wheel, and whispered promises under a starlit sky. Aisha suddenly gasped. I remember this that summer when we went to the county fair in Roanoke. We had our first kiss on the Ferris wheel. She looked at me with teary eyes, lost in the memory. But there was a problem. Aisha and I had never been to a county fair in Roanoke. We'd met in college in New York and had never visited Virginia until now. Before I could voice my confusion, another song began. This one was upbeat, detailing a family picnic by a lakeside with children laughing and playing in the water. Maya and Sammy's eyes lit up. That's like the time we went to Lake Anna and had that huge water balloon fight, Sammy exclaimed. Again, this was a memory that didn't exist. We'd never been to Lake Anna. Song after song, the radio played tunes that evoked memories we hadn't lived. There was the winter ballad that reminded Aisha of a snowy dance we'd never attended and the rock anthem that brought back memories of a concert where Maya had supposedly gotten her first guitar pick. The atmosphere in the car grew thick with a mix of nostalgia and confusion. It was as if the radio was tapping into an alternate timeline, 
playing songs from moments that had never occurred in our lives, but felt as real as any other memory. As the sun set, the signal began to fade, and the mysterious WVLR Memories 88.9 was replaced by static. We drove in silence, each of us lost in our thoughts, trying to make sense of the phantom memories. We reached our destination, a cozy cabin in the mountains, but the events of the drive dominated our conversations. We speculated about the nature of memories, parallel universes, and the power of music to evoke emotions. That night, as the kids slept and Aisha and I sat on the porch, looking up at the stars, she whispered, even if those memories aren't real, they felt beautiful. It's like we got a glimpse into another life, another version of us. I nodded, wrapping my arm around her. Maybe in some other universe, those memories are real. And that version of us is reminiscing about our memories, wondering about a life where they met in New York and took road trips through Virginia. We laughed at the thought, but the magic of the forgotten playlist stayed with us. It was a reminder of the infinite possibilities of life, the countless paths not taken, and the beautiful moments that exist, whether we've lived them or not. It was a foggy evening as I drove through the winding roads of the Appalachian Mountains. The mist was thick, reducing visibility to just a few feet ahead. As I rounded a bend, I spotted a figure on the side of the road, thumb outstretched. Given the weather and the remoteness of the location, I decided to stop. The hitchhiker was a young woman, dressed in a faded floral dress that looked like it belonged to another era. Her eyes were a deep shade of blue, and there was a certain sadness about her. Thank you, she whispered as she climbed in. I need to get to Silverpine. I was taken aback. Silverpine was a town that had been abandoned after a mining disaster in the 1940s. Are you sure? There's nothing left of Silverpine. She nodded. It's where I need to be. We drove in silence, the only sound being the hum of the engine and the occasional droplets of rain hitting the windshield. As we approached the old location of Silver Pine, the fog grew denser. The hitchhiker pointed to a dilapidated sign barely visible through the mist. Just up ahead, she said. I slowed the car, trying to navigate through the thick fog. When I turned to ask her for more specific directions, I found the passenger seat empty. The door was still closed, and there was no sign of her anywhere. Confused and a little frightened, I continued driving until I reached the remnants of Silver Pine. The town was a ghostly sight, with decaying buildings and overgrown vegetation. In the town square, there was a memorial with names of those who had perished in the mining disaster. Curiosity got the better of me, and I approached the memorial. As I scanned the names, one caught my attention. Lila May Thompson. Below the name was a picture of the young woman I had picked up, wearing the same faded floral dress. A chill ran down my spine. I quickly got back in my car and drove away, the image of Lila May's sad blue eyes etched in my mind. The fog began to lift, and as I looked in the rearview mirror, Silver Pine disappeared into the mist, along with the phantom hitchhiker who had once called it home. The old, wrinkled map called to me from the dusty shelves of my grandfather's study. As a child, I had spent hours poring over its faded contours and landmarks, dreaming of the adventures it promised in foreign lands. But one road had always captivated my imagination, Route 00. It meandered whimsically across the map, not seeming to connect any two points in particular. My grandfather said he had never discovered where it led, 
though he had searched for years. When I inherited the map after his passing, the unfinished business of Route 00 beckoned. I set off on a journey to trace its path, hoping to uncover the secrets behind this mysterious road. Mile after mile I followed it, the dotted line leading me through forests and valleys, over hills and streams. Food and fuel dwindled as the days wore on, but I pressed forward, drawn irresistibly by the promise of what lay ahead. The road grew steadily narrower and less maintained. With each turn, the surroundings grew more ominous, the way ahead darker. Still I continued, shadows now seeming to creep from the woods to encircle me. Finally, the crumbling pavement dwindled to a single dirt track through the gnarled trees. My heart pounded as I glimpsed a small light shining in the distance. This was what I had been searching for all along. I stumbled into a clearing, where the moldering remains of an old carnival lay sprawled before me. This was a place that time had forgotten, that the world had left behind. As I walked slowly past the decaying tents and rides, memories of my childhood began flooding back, of warm summer nights spent at the county fair with grandfather. A carousel sat silent, once bright horses faded and peeling. In the Hall of Mirrors, I saw reflections, not of myself, but of friends and family, long gone. Around each corner lay a glimpse into my past, sending me deeper down forgotten paths in my own mind. I wandered for what felt like hours through the abandoned carnival, each exhibit triggering another vivid memory. The fun house with its warped mirrors took me back to the time I got lost as a child and stumbled out in tears. The broken down roller coaster reminded me of laughing wildly while clinging to my grandfather's arm. With every step, the past became more real than the decay surrounding me. I found myself mentally revisiting moments I hadn't thought of in years. The first time I rode a bike, school dances, graduations. It was as if this place held within it the very essence of my memories. Finally, I arrived at the abandoned Ferris wheel, rising skeletal against the night sky. One last carriage waited, as if beckoning me aboard for a final ride. I stepped into the creaking car, and as the wheel lurched into motion, began a slow ascent into the darkness above. Looking down, the road that had led me there now seemed to stretch on without end, two paths diverging, one into memory, and one into infinite unknown. As the carriage rocked higher, pulling me away, flickers of past regrets and unrealized dreams began to play before my eyes. I saw the paths not taken, the risks not ventured, but interspersed were memories of accomplishments, loved ones, moments of joy. A kaleidoscope of memory and emotion engulfed me, somehow more vivid and real than anything in my present life. I knew then the truth about Route 00. It leads wanderers not to any physical place, but deep into the recesses of their own hearts, minds and fears, revealing their secrets. Whether it was real or only a dream, I may never know. But I emerged from that forest changed, memories made vivid again, mysteries of my own heart illuminated. The journey itself was the destination. Route 00 is an invitation to reckon with where you've been, who you became along the way, and where those winding back roads of life might yet lead, if you dare to follow them. It was supposed to be a simple road trip. My friends, Priya, Carlos, and I, had planned a weekend getaway to a cabin in the woods. The drive was straightforward, a four-hour journey through the heart of Oregon's dense forests. We set off early in the morning, our car packed with snacks, music playlists ready, and spirits high. As we drove, we chatted, sang along to our favorite songs, and admired the scenic beauty outside. 
About two hours into our journey, we approached a tunnel carved into the side of a mountain. The entrance was framed by old, moss-covered stones, and the inside was pitch black, the other end not visible. Carlos, who was driving, joked, feels like we're entering the twilight zone. We laughed, but as we entered the tunnel, an eerie silence enveloped the car. The radio lost signal, and our voices seemed muffled, as if the very air inside the tunnel was absorbing sound. It felt like mere minutes before we emerged on the other side, blinking against the bright sunlight. We all let out a collective sigh of relief, the tunnel's oppressive atmosphere still fresh in our minds. But as we continued driving, something felt off. The landscape looked different, more overgrown, as if nature had reclaimed the area. The road signs indicated that we were only 10 minutes away from our cabin, which was impossible given we had at least two more hours to go. Confused, I checked my watch, expecting it to be around noon. But to my shock, it read 5.30 p.m. Priya checked her phone, and it showed the same time. We had somehow lost over five hours but the journey through the tunnel had felt like mere minutes. Panic set in. We tried to retrace our steps, but everything was a blur. We remembered entering the tunnel, the silence, and then exiting into the changed landscape. When we reached the cabin, the owner, an elderly woman named Mrs. Adler, greeted us. Seeing our distressed faces, she invited us in for tea. As we recounted our experience, she listened intently, nodding occasionally. Once we finished, she sighed. Ah, the lost tunnel. I've heard tales, but you're the first I've met who's experienced it. She explained that the tunnel was ancient, older than any records could trace. Over the years, travelers had reported similar experiences, losing hours or even days after passing through. No one knew why or how it happened, but it was always on days when the sun was particularly bright, casting the tunnel into deep shadow. Mrs. Adler's words sent chills down our spines. We were grateful to be safe, but the lost hours weighed heavily on our minds. What had happened in the time we couldn't account for? The rest of the weekend was uneventful, but the mystery of the lost tunnel stayed with us. We decided to take a different route home, not wanting to risk another encounter. To this day, we still wonder about those lost hours. Were we in some sort of time warp? Did we experience things we couldn't remember? The answers remain elusive, but one thing is certain. The lost tunnel, with its ability to bend and steal time, is a reminder of the mysteries that still exist in our world, waiting to be discovered. The night was moonless and bitterly cold as I steered my rattling old car down the deserted back road. It was a shortcut I'd taken for years, but tonight the wind howled through dead trees with unusual menace. According to local legend, on certain winter nights like this, a phantom highway would appear branching off from this road, leading drivers to their doom. Though I brushed off such tales, a shiver ran through me as I squinted into the dark. Sure enough, my headlights suddenly illuminated a cracked asphalt path I'd never noticed before. A weathered sign read, Ghost Highway, enter at your own peril. An icy chill rippled through me. This must be the haunted road described fearfully by the townsfolk. Those who entered were never heard from again. Clearly, some force or entity lured travelers to their ends down this sinister passage. I hesitated gripped by both unease and morbid curiosity. The phantom road awaited, daring me to uncover its secrets, or sealing my fate. Curiosity won out, and I turned onto the crumbling pavement. My tires rumbled as if passing through a barrier between worlds. Instantly, fog rolled in, obscuring the way ahead. I drove slowly, squinting through the white veil that enveloped the car. 
the stories of this coast highway echoed in my mind. In Japan, a similar mist-shrouded road allegedly led to the realm of the deed, never allowing any to return to the land of the living. In Ireland, a phantom path was said to carry victims away, to be sacrificed to ancient pagan gods. What horrors awaited down this forsaken route? Glowing shapes began to form in the fog ahead. I gasped as they took the shape of hulking men with distorted faces and hollow eyes. They lurched toward the car, emitting unearthly moans. I swerved around the phantoms, breath racing. More began to stagger out of the darkness, clawing with spectral hands. It was as if the tortured souls of past victims now guarded this road, craving fresh prey. Tires screeching, I barely avoided the ghost's grasp. But escape seemed impossible. No matter how far I drove, the road stretched on endlessly ahead. Panic rose in my chest. I was trapped on this endless haunted highway that delivered all into the arms of horrors. In the rearview mirror, I noticed a vehicle approaching fast behind me. It was a battered old hearse, driven by a tall, shadowy figure in a wide-brimmed hat. The mysterious undertaker pursuing lone travelers to ferry their souls. As it drew closer, I noticed a coffin rattling around in the back, freshly filled. Was it meant for me next? I pushed the gas pedal down hard, speeding away from the sinister hearse. It kept pace, inching ever closer. Up ahead, I could make out a crumbling bridge spanning a churning black river. Passing over it might be my only escape from this nightmare road. I blew past the moaning ghosts and raced towards the bridge. Behind me, the hearse's headlights flared, blinding me for a moment. I swerved back on course, engine roaring as I neared the bridge. Rotting planks whizzed under my tires and I braced for the bumpy passage over the river. But instead, I emerged back into the blinding fog. Somehow the bridge had transported me back to the start of the ghost highway, trapped in an endless loop. The mysterious hearse was gone, but the groaning phantoms still surrounded the car, seeking their next victim. Panic surged through me. I was doomed to drive this haunted road eternally until finally the fog spirits claimed me. But I had to fight. Gripping the wheel with white knuckles, I turned the car around back toward the bridge. It was my only hope of escaping this nightmare realm. The ghost's wails grew deafening as I raced back down the road. I would not share their fate. Up ahead, the bridge came into view once more. Flooring the gas pedal, I rocketed toward it faster than before. This time as I crossed the river, I did not slow down. I blasted over the bridge, screaming a defiant cry against the denizens of this haunted road. Blinding light enveloped me, along with the groans of a thousand lost souls. Suddenly, I was through. The fog vanished, and the smooth pavement of the main highway lay ahead, bathed in moonlight. Glancing back, there was no sign of the phantom bridge or spirits that prowled it. I had escaped the ghost highway's endless loop. Shaken, I drove on through the cold night, grateful to be back in the land of the living. But the haunted road calls still from the edge of town, beckoning the unwary into its eerie embrace. Those who listen and enter face an eternity trapped between worlds, never able to find their way back home. Flat tire, middle of nowhere, no cell reception, the trifecta of a road trip gone bad. I cursed under my breath as I surveyed the situation. My car sat lopsided on the gravel road, as desolate a spot as you could imagine. The sky was beginning to bruise with twilight, and the prospects of changing a tire in the dark were far from appealing. Just when I thought things couldn't get worse, Headlights appeared in my rearview mirror, a pickup truck, ancient but well-kept, slowing down as it approached. A sliver of hope. Maybe I wasn't so unlucky after all. 
The truck parked behind me, and out stepped a man, older, weather-beaten but spry. His overalls were stained with years of oil and grit, the name Eugene embroidered above his heart. Looks like you could use some help, he said, squinting at my flat tire. Would be much appreciated, I replied, relief washing over me. Eugene moved with a quiet efficiency, unpacking his toolkit and getting to work. His hands were strong, deft, each movement precise. In no time he had the flat tire off and the spare on. There you go, he said, wiping his hands on a rag. Good as new. I couldn't believe my luck. How much do I owe you? He waved a dismissive hand. Consider it a favor. Just pay it forward when you can. I thanked him profusely, still awed by the timely intervention. As he drove away, his truck's taillights faded into the encroaching darkness, as if swallowed whole. When I got back into town, I headed straight for the nearest garage to get a proper tire replacement. While there, I mentioned Eugene and how he'd helped me out. The mechanic paused, his face turning a shade paler. Did you say Eugene? Drives an old Ford pickup? Yeah, that's him. Know him. The mechanic looked at me as if I'd grown a second head. Eugene's been dead for years, passed away in that very truck, a collision up on Millersfield Road. A cold shiver trickled down my spine. That's impossible. He helped me just a couple hours ago, changed my flat tire and everything. The mechanic stared, then walked over to a cluttered bulletin board on the wall. He shuffled through various papers and pulled out a faded newspaper clipping, handed it to me. The headline read, Local Mechanic Dies in Tragic Accident. And there he was, Eugene, unmistakable despite the grainy black and white photograph, that familiar smile, those wise eyes. I felt my knees weaken, my stomach turn. Looks like Eugene's still looking out for folks, the mechanic murmured, reclaiming the article and pinning it back on the board. I left the garage in a daze, new tire in place, but my understanding of reality irrevocably altered. I had been helped by a man who was no longer of this world, a long dead handyman, still aiding travelers in distress. As I drove away, the thought weighed on me, heavy but oddly comforting. Whatever force let Eugene linger, it was a benevolent one a shred of goodness stitched into the fabric of an otherwise indifferent universe. And as I merged onto the highway, my eyes flicked to the rearview mirror, half expecting to see those headlights one more time. But all that met my gaze was the open road and the gathering night. I was driving the empty stretch of highway late at night, glancing at the peeling billboards littering the roadside. Most displayed dull ads for cheap motels and roadside diners. But one caught my eye, a blank white sign marked only with black lettering. Turn back now. A prickle ran down my neck. It seemed less a warning than a dark prophecy. But I shook off my unease and drove on through the creeping fog. Miles later, Another mysterious billboard emerged. Last exit, one mile. Again, a creep of dread. These signs almost seemed to know my presence here, long after midnight on this abandoned route. I chalked it up to fatigue and the mist playing tricks. But soon, more ominous messages began to take shape in the haze. We have been waiting. Your journey ends here. Each gave me a start, my imagination spiraling. Who was sending these silent warnings? Distracted, I nearly missed a faded placard peeking from the thicket. Turn back, dead end ahead. I slowed, gripping the wheel. This deserted back road was a shortcut I'd taken for years without incident, but the sign's persistent warnings filled me with foreboding. Still, only a few more miles to go. I pushed on warily. That's when it emerged ahead 
a towering billboard stark against the darkness. Last chance. My breath caught. Dread coursed through me, but the road ahead remained smooth and empty. With a shaking laugh, I dismissed my fears as fanciful. The messages were merely pranks, not grim portents. But then, around a sharp bend, my headlights fell upon one final board, rooted in the dirt shoulder. Its message turned my blood to ice. Sarah, we are waiting for you. The breath left my chest. My name on this remote road, impossible yet undeniably real. These were no pranks, but dire warnings from an unknown force. I floored the gas pedal, swerving around the last sign. Had to outrun this nightmare highway with its messages from beyond the void. Tires squealing. I raced on through the dark, eyes wild for a branching road to escape this valley of omens. But the way ahead remained stubbornly straight and desolate, my only choice forward or back. And then, behind me, a new light flared, harsh and blinding. An engine roared, drawing closer until it loomed large in my rear view. An unmarked white van, creeping up fast, headlights seeming to glow with malevolence. My terrified gaze jumped back to the road ahead. No exits, no turnoffs to shake my pursuer. The van edged nearer until it was just feet from my bumper, high beams flooding my car. Trapped on this road between darkness and darkness, this was the end the omens foretold. So I made my choice, floor the gas and leave the road entirely. My car jolted down the rocky shoulder, slamming into the ditch. The van blared past, unable to follow. Wheels spinning, I gritted my teeth and slammed the pedal down, fighting to climb out of the gully. With one last grunt of effort, my battered car lurched back onto the pavement. The white van was gone, its high beams fading into the distance. I rolled to a stop, hazard lights blinking, breath heaving. A close call, but I'd escaped the road's omens and my pursuer along with it. Relief flooded through me as I steadied my shaking hands, but relief faded to chilling awe as I peered behind me. At the spot where I left the road, there stood no ditch or rocky drop-off, only more cracked pavement stretching unbroken into the past. No gully existed to have trapped me. There was no earthly reason I should be free. The full force of realization hit me, this was no ordinary road. Something beyond reason led me here, and now let me go, spared from the grim fate the signs foretold. Numb, I drove on until finally reaching safe asphalt and lamp-lit streets. But I knew now never again to take that darkness-veiled back road, for I had glimpsed the void and those who dwell beyond. By some grace, I slipped free this time. But next time, I may not escape the highway's messages from beyond. The waiting ones would have their due. The long stretch of midnight highway unfurled before me as I drove through the rugged countryside. This desolate road was a shortcut to my destination, but my grip tightened on the wheel as local legends surfaced in my mind. Locals had spoken of this highway's hauntings, phantoms who preyed upon lost travelers. I tried to shake off my nerves. Ghost stories were merely fiction after all. But alone on this forgotten route, I could not ignore the chill creeping down my spine. My headlights illuminated a battered sign scenic route seven this remote byway was said to be plagued by a variety of supernatural horrors in ireland nearly identical roads held the same name and tales of spirits known as wailing women their shrieks echoing as they searched eternally for their lost children in japan an analogous winding highway crossed the forest of aokigahara infamous for its uray ghosts of the forgotten. But the local legend that unnerved me most centered around a phantom hitchhiker. 
Stories told of a young woman dressed in white standing on the roadside, silently begging for a ride. Any driver who dared stop for her soon disappeared, never to be seen again. My gas light suddenly blinked on, and my stomach dropped. I was running low on fuel, still miles from civilization. With no choice, I kept driving down the pitch black road. The rocky cliffs around me seemed to close in as a dense fog rolled across my path. I could barely see ahead when through the mist, I spotted a faded sign for a gas station. Grateful, I veered off towards the weathered building. Perhaps they still provided services to wayward travelers like myself. But as I pulled up, not a light shone in the decrepit station. A rusty old pump stood unused amidst weeds. Everything about the place screamed abandonment, except for one detail, a yellow payphone under an overhanging roof. Could it possibly still work? Worth a try, since my cell had no signal. I dug for loose change in my glove box and walked over. The payphone's cracked receiver felt heavy and cold in my hand. I lifted it to my ear, deposited my coins, and miraculously heard a dial tone. Quickly I punched 911, seeking aid, or at least directions. One ring, then two. Suddenly a girl's voice answered, her tone strange and distant. Please, help me. I jumped, taken aback. I cautiously asked who was speaking, but she only replied again, now clearly desperate. Please, you must help. He's coming. Her plea sent a chill through me, but I pressed for details. Where was she? What was happening? The voice grew fainter, as if speaking from the end of a long tunnel. Her last words sank my heart. He's here. He's... Then only static. I slammed the receiver down, breathing fast. This was no 911 call. Dread flooded my veins at the implication. Somehow I had connected directly with the ghost girl hitchhiker herself, calling across dimensions for aid. I ran back to my car, throwing it into gear. Peeling out back onto the road, I pushed the gas pedal to the floor. But only minutes later, through my headlights piercing the night mist, a shadow took shape. The silhouette of a young woman emerged. My blood turned to ice. It was her. The phantom wore a gossamer white dress, raven hair flowing untamed over her face. She stood utterly still, thumb outraised. Every fiber of my being screamed not to stop, but her form drew closer in my high beams, her thumb still desperately lifted. Against all reason, I pulled over, though never stopping fully. Perhaps I could help free her spirit. She floated to my passenger window, peering in. And then I saw her face, skin paler than snow, eyes jet black and devoid of life. Her beauty was chilling, otherworldly, this was no trapped soul, but something far more sinister. Ancient instinct took over, and I floored the gas. The phantom smile stretched unnaturally wide as I left her behind, fading back into the fog. I raced onwards, pursued only by my pounding heart. Local legends were true. This was a haunted highway, stalked by a deceiving, vengeful ghost. I dared not glance back to see if she followed still. Only the road ahead mattered now. I drove until I reached the highway's end, where it rejoined the main interstate. The disappeared into dawn's first light. But I know I'll never take the haunted detour of Road 7 again. For some journeys lead places from which we can never return, waylaid forever by the spirits that walk our darkest byways. The highway was a ribbon of darkness, my truck's headlights barely making a dent. Mile after endless mile, I'd been listening to country songs and chugging lukewarm coffee. There's a rhythm to the road at night, a hum that can hypnotize you if you're not careful. My eyes started to blur, a dangerous lull seeping into my bones. That's when I saw her, 
a figure on the side of the road, draped in what looked like a white shawl. Odd. People don't usually walk along interstates at 3 a.m., not in places like this, where the closest town is a good half-hour drive away. Something about her posture said she wasn't hitchhiking, wasn't lost. She seemed to be waiting for something or someone. My first instinct was to drive past. Maybe it was fatigue. Maybe it was the jaded part of me that thought it was some sort of setup. But something compelled me to pull over, tires crunching on the gravel shoulder. She approached the truck without hesitation, as if she'd been expecting me. No face, just darkness under the hood of her shawl. But when she spoke, her voice was young, almost melodious. Do you seek fortune, driver? I almost laughed. Fortune was a long shot for a guy hauling freight cross-country. More like decent mileage and good coffee. Her head tilted, considering. Follow me, she said. And then she turned away, floating, yeah, floating, about a foot above the ground. My instincts screamed not to, but I was suddenly overtaken by curiosity. Shifting the truck into gear, I trailed her as she glided smoothly along the edge of the road. The whole setup screamed of legends, of La Llorona, or the Japanese Yurei. But this wasn't Mexico or Japan. This was a lonely stretch of American asphalt. Eventually, she led me off the highway onto an unmarked dirt road. My truck bumped and jostled, and for a moment I feared I'd lose her in the dust and darkness. But she was always just ahead, an eerie beacon. The road ended abruptly at the entrance to what looked like an abandoned barn. She stopped and turned toward me. Inside, you will find what you seek. I should have bolted right then, turned that truck around and sped back to the sanctuary of the highway. But I didn't. Instead, I stepped out and walked into the barn. The wood creaked under my weight dust motes floating lazily in the slivers of moonlight that snuck through the gaps in the slats. There was something on a rickety table at the center, half buried under a tattered cloth, a metal box with an intricate lock. I reached out, hands trembling. Before I could touch it, a cold wind blasted through the barn, extinguishing what little light there was. My heart hammered in my chest. I groped around, grabbed the box, and bolted back to my truck. The figure was gone. I didn't open the box until I'd driven a good hundred miles. Inside, nestled in faded velvet, was an antique pocket watch. I grabbed it and flipped it open. The time was stuck at 3.15, the exact moment I'd first seen her. Only then did it hit me. What if she'd led me to something darker, something malevolent? I felt a shiver creep up my spine, but by then, the road was pulling me again back into its monotonous hum, and the night stretched long and endless ahead. Nightfall in the forest has its own language. The rustling leaves, the far-off hoot of an owl, and the subtle creaks of swaying trees form a symphony that speaks to the insomniac in me. On nights when sleep is a distant promise, I find myself outside, in a small clearing near my cabin, staring at the sky sprinkled with stars. But it was last night that the forest revealed a chapter of its language I had never understood before. I stepped into the clearing, my eyes tracing the familiar constellations. Orion's belt. Cassiopeia, Ursa Major. Just as I began to retreat back to the cabin, I noticed it. The shadows of the trees were shifting. Not the way shadows normally do, flitting and fading with the passing clouds or moonlight, but in a deliberate, rhythmic motion. The towering shapes of oaks and pines morphed, their silhouettes transforming into figures so massive they seemed like giants. I blinked, rubbed my eyes, and even pinched myself. The shapes remained. They danced in slow circles, their movements synchronized with the songs of the night, 
each sway of their elongated arms in harmony with the rustle of leaves, each step in tune with the creaking of branches. My heart thudded in my chest, not out of fear, but awe. My feet felt anchored to the ground, as if the very earth commanded me to witness this hidden ritual. I fumbled for my phone, considering capturing this surreal spectacle, but something stopped me. The act felt intrusive, like snapping a photo in the middle of a sacred ceremony. So I watched, my eyes wide, my breaths shallow, as the giants continued their dance. As the first light of dawn began to stretch across the sky, the figures gradually retreated, their forms disentangling from the shapes of giants back into the gnarled branches and trunks of trees. Just like that, the forest returned to its usual self, as if the giants had been nothing more than figments of my imagination. I walked back to the cabin in a daze, the image of the dancing giants imprinted on my mind like an indelible ink. Throughout the day, I pondered what I had witnessed. Was it a trick of the light, a vivid dream, or perhaps a rare glimpse into the forest's hidden folklore? Tonight, I find myself back in the clearing, watching the sky transition from the hues of sunset to the deep blue of night. The shadows stretch and loom as darkness descends, but there are no dancing giants this time. Whether they were a one-time marvel or a regular event for which I lack the secret schedule, I may never know. However, the forest seems different to me now, more alive, more enigmatic, a place of mysteries and untold tales. I feel privileged to have witnessed its hidden dance, a spectacle that's added a new layer of wonder to my nights. And so, every evening, I continue to step out into the clearing, not just to look for the giants, but to listen, to observe, to be a part of the forest's ever-evolving language. Even if the giants never return, their dance remains etched in my memory, a secret chapter in my ongoing relationship with the night, a silent pact with the hidden rhythms of nature. The hike started like any other, a blend of sunlight and shadow, fresh air, and the freedom that only a trail could offer. My backpack settled comfortably on my shoulders as I took the familiar path leading up toward the mountain summit. Birds offered their songs as if to cheer me on. Everything was right in the world, that is, until I stumbled upon the clearing. A gnarled tree stood at its center, its limbs reaching outward like a pleading gesture. Around the trunk, tattered pieces of paper were pinned, remnants of past hikers and their ventures. As a hiker myself, I knew it was a tradition. Leave a note, take a note, sort of like an unofficial ledger of those who've come and gone. Curious, I stepped closer to inspect the scraps of paper. Some were simple messages. John was here or Sarah and Mike made it to the top. But my eyes caught on one poster, a missing person notice, weathered by time and rain. My breath hitched as I looked closer. It was me. Dated five years into the future, the paper showed a photograph remarkably like the one on my driver's license. My name was printed in bold, stark letters, missing. Last seen hiking near Stone Mountain. Contact if you have any information. A cold sweat broke out across my back. My hands trembled as I pulled my phone out to capture a picture of the poster, half expecting it to disappear like a figment of some surreal dream. But there it remained, in the frame of my screen, and in reality before me. Questions spiraled through my mind like a relentless whirlpool. Was this a prank? A cruel joke plotted by a friend or an enemy? But why? And how could they produce something so convincing? Yet, if it was a joke, why did my gut churn with such intense unease, as though reality itself had twisted askew? I left the clearing as quickly as I could, 
my pace now a hurried march. The rest of the trail felt longer, the mountain air denser. The forest no longer whispered its comforting lullabies. Instead, it seemed to close in on me like an imposing maze. Every rustle of leaves, every snap of a twig, took on an ominous tone. I pushed on, propelled by a desire to put as much distance as possible between me and that eerie clearing. When I finally emerged from the trail, I felt like I'd been spat out from another world. I threw my gear into the car and sped home, where I examined the photo I'd taken. The image on the screen was as unsettling as the paper itself, a ghostly harbinger of a future I didn't understand. Days turned into weeks, and the incident transformed into an unsettling memory, buried but never forgotten. I considered showing the photo to friends, to family, even to the police. But something stopped me each time, the unsettling notion that some questions are better left unanswered. Still, the poster changed something fundamental in me. These days, when I hike, I steer clear of that specific trail, opting for paths that offer fewer questions and more peace of mind. Yet sometimes, when the night is still and sleep evades me, I find myself pondering that mysterious poster, a harbinger of an unspoken future. Could it be a twisted rip in the fabric of time, a prank, or a warning? I may never know. And perhaps that uncertainty is the most unsettling part of it all a mystery that trails behind me like an ever-present shadow, lurking just beyond the horizon of my understanding. The first time I heard it, my hands froze over my dinner plate, fork half raised. The sound cut through the usual evening quiet, a human scream, elongated and piercing. My heart raced. Instinct pulled me to my feet, but reason anchored me. It happened again, another scream, the sound filling the empty corners of my cabin. My neighbor had warned me, said it was the birds, but a primal part of me buzzed with alarm. I had to know. Flashlight in hand, I ventured into the dark labyrinth of trees. Moonlight filtered through the canopy, casting shifting patterns on the ground. The forest seemed to breathe, and my footsteps sounded like an invasion. Then it happened. A scream so close I could almost feel the vibration in the air. I swung my flashlight toward the sound, half expecting to see a face twisted in anguish. Instead, a bird, a black silhouette against the dark sky, swooped from a branch and disappeared into the underbrush. More screams joined in, a cacophony that felt like an eerie choir. Birds? Mimicking human agony? My mind spun, juggling disbelief and the chilling reality. I watched as they fluttered from tree to tree, each scream indistinguishable from a human's. Yet, something was missing. No anguish, no pain, just air funneled through feathers and beak. Eventually I returned home, but sleep eluded me. Lying in bed, staring at the ceiling, I wrestled with what I had heard, what I had seen. Nature, as it turns out, is neither kind nor malevolent. It simply is. The birds screamed not out of sorrow, but because that's what they did, a chilling phenomenon without rhyme or reason. Days turned into weeks, and I found a new routine. I still heard the birds, their nightly screams a haunting lullaby that no longer robbed me of sleep. It became a part of my life, another element in the complex mosaic of the forest. I never found out why the birds scream, and maybe that's the point. In a world teeming with questions, not all answers bring comfort. Sometimes the enigma is more tolerable than the truth. And so, I let the birds scream. They fill the night with sound, each cry an enigmatic note in the symphony of the forest. It's unsettling, yes, but it's also a reminder, a stark, unforgiving echo of life's complexities. 
and I listen. But for the past week, our hikes had gained an unexpected soundtrack, a second bark echoing Stella's but coming from an unseen source. Every time Stella barked at a squirrel or sent a joyous hello into the wilderness, this other bark would respond. It was uncanny, a perfect mimic of Stella's own vocalizations, yet somehow hollow, as if coming from far away or perhaps from somewhere much closer than I cared to think. Tonight was no different. As we stepped onto the familiar path, Stella let out a playful bark, and sure enough, the second bark replied. This phantom canine always seemed to be just out of sight, hiding behind a curtain of trees and leaves. I had considered every reasonable explanation, a neighbor's dog, an animal with a similar sounding call, even the playful acoustics of the forest. But the more I heard it, the less it sounded like any of those things. Tonight, my curiosity reached its boiling point. I decided to find out once and for all where this other bark was coming from. Come on, Stella, let's find your friend, I said, a note of forced cheerfulness in my voice. Stella looked up at me, ears perked, as if she too sensed that this hike was different. I led her off the main trail, following the direction from which the second bark seemed to emanate. Stella hesitated, then followed, her steps more cautious than usual. The second bark sounded again, closer this time, pulling us deeper into the woods. The sun was setting, and shadows stretched long fingers across the path, making the trees appear taller and more menacing. Stella barked, perhaps sensing my tension, and the second bark answered, now sounding not just like an echo, but like a distorted version of Stella's bark, as if heard through a broken speaker. The forest was darker now, and I flicked on my flashlight, its beam cutting through the gloom. I felt disoriented, as if the trees had rearranged themselves to confuse me. It was foolish to be here after dark, I realized. My gut screamed at me to turn back, but I needed to know. Just then, Stella growled a low, rumbling sound I'd never heard her make. The fur on her back stood on end. My heart pounded in my chest as I swung my flashlight around, half expecting to catch a pair of eyes staring back at us. But there was nothing, only an impenetrable wall of darkness. That's when it hit me. The second bark had stopped. The forest was silent, save for my own breathing and the distant rustle of leaves. Whatever had been mimicking Stella was gone, or perhaps it had never been there at all. I looked down at Stella, who seemed as relieved as I was to retreat. As we made our way back to the trail, the normal sounds of the forest gradually returned. The chirping of crickets, the hoot of an owl, even Stella's own occasional bark. But the second bark remained absent, as if swallowed by the woods. We never heard it again after that night and our hikes return to their peaceful routine. Yet the experience lingers at the back of my mind, a mystery without an answer. I still venture into the woods, drawn by their beauty and tranquility, but there's a cautiousness now, a heightened awareness. I listen more than I used to, attuned to the hidden life that teems just beyond the reach of sight and understanding. As for Stella, she still bounds ahead with joyful abandon, but I've noticed she sticks closer now, as if she too understands that some mysteries are better left unsolved. Sometimes I catch her pausing, ears perked, as if waiting for something, but whatever she's listening for remains silent, a haunting whisper that has vanished into the depths of the forest, leaving only questions in its wake. I had been exploring the dense woods for the weekend, 
a lone venture to satisfy my restless spirit. The well was not what I had expected to find. My plans involved wildlife photography and the simple joy of fire-cooked meals, not relics of human settlement deep in a place where even GPS feared to tread. I approached cautiously, the hairs on the back of my neck tingling with an instinctual caution. Nature had long reclaimed this space, but the well remained like a scar that refused to heal. The air was thick, and I felt the weight of a silence that seemed to have settled ages ago. Then came the voice. Help me. It was a whisper, a desperate plea spiraling up from the inky depths below. My blood ran cold. I strained my ears, wondering if it was a trick of the wind or an echo bouncing through the forest. Please, help me. There it was again, unmistakable this time, a voice tinged with anguish. My rational mind screamed at me. A voice from an ancient well, miles from any human habitation. Impossible. Yet my conscience, that stubborn internal compass, refused to let me walk away. Against better judgment, I rummaged through my backpack for my flashlight and rope. Knotting the rope securely around a sturdy tree, I shined the flashlight into the well. Nothing but an impenetrable darkness stared back, swallowing the beam as if mocking my feeble attempt to unveil its secrets. With a deep breath, I began my descent, hand over hand, each downward movement a commitment to the unknown. The walls of the well closed in, damp and claustrophobic, and the air grew colder as I plunged further into the dark. Finally, my feet touched solid ground. I clicked on the flashlight and scanned my surroundings. My heart sank. There was nothing there, no trapped animal, no lost hiker, just a small vacant underground chamber with walls of stone and earth. The reality of my situation hit me like a wave. I was alone in an ancient well chasing a voice that couldn't possibly exist. I felt foolish and unsettled, unnerved by the echoing silence that now filled the space. As I began my ascent, pulling myself up the rope, a chilling thought crawled into my mind. What if the voice wasn't coming from the bottom, but from somewhere above? The realization propelled me faster, my muscles aching as I neared the top. When I finally emerged from the well, gasping for air. I looked around frantically. The forest appeared the same, indifferent to my turmoil, but the weight of unseen eyes pressed upon me. I pulled up the rope, packed my gear, and without a backward glance, retreated from that haunted place. The hike back to camp was a blur, my thoughts a jumble of relief and apprehension. Had I imagined it all? A trick of acoustics, perhaps. But what about that insistent plea, so filled with raw emotion? I broke camp the following morning, cutting my trip short. As I made my way out of the forest, I realized that I was leaving with more than just photographs and memories. I was taking a piece of the forest's unsettling enigma with me, a riddle that would forever remain unsolved. I never returned to that well, never sought it out on later trips or on any maps. Some mysteries, I decided, are better left as they are. Unexplained echoes in the wilderness of both the world and the mind. Yet, the voice from the well has never left me, its plea lingering in quiet moments, forever raising questions that dare not be answered. We were pretty beat from the long drive, but we stayed up late hanging around the fire, having some beers and grilling hot dogs. It felt good to be out here disconnected from everything. The woods were so peaceful at night. At some point, Dana said she heard music playing faintly in the distance. We all quieted down and listened. Sure enough, we could make out the indistinct sounds of people laughing and singing along to guitar music. Must be another group's campsite nearby. Let's go crash their party, Tyler said. 
He was pretty buzzed by then. Yeah, I want to see who else is out here, Dana added. She looked a little creeped out by the distant music and wanted company. I shrugged and figured why not. We grabbed flashlights and started hiking through the dark trees toward the sounds. I felt sticks and rocks poking into my feet through my thin sneakers. As we walked deeper into the woods, the music got louder and more raucous, like a full-on party. We shouted a few, hellos, but no one ever answered back. The forest just seemed to swallow up our voices. We kept on toward the sound of singing and laughing, even though the hair on my arms was standing up. I couldn't see any distant campfire light or anything. Finally, we came stumbling into a little clearing. They must be just on the other side, Tyler said excitedly. But there was nothing. The music cut off abruptly, leaving just the normal nightwood sounds. No tents, coolers, picnic tables. Nothing to indicate a campsite had been there at all. That's bizarre. I know I heard people here, Dana said in a small voice. We all felt the creep factor rising. Let's get back to our site, I urged. We turned our flashlights back toward where I thought our camp was, but after 15 minutes of walking, there was no sign of it. We were well and truly lost. The laughter was long gone. It was dead quiet now, except for branches scratching and critters scurrying. Even our own campfire light had vanished. We wandered in the dark woods for what felt like hours, getting more turned around by the minute. Exhausted and freaked out, we took shelter under a rocky overhang as the first light of dawn started glowing through the trees. I don't know what was going on in these woods, but we sure as hell couldn't wait to get out of there. This was one camping trip I won't be forgetting any time soon. As a warning, this story does contain the mention of self-deletion. When I was around six years old, my dad's best friend ended his life. We'll call him Joe for the sake of the story. Obviously, it was a very rough and emotional time for my dad. Joe was my dad's best man at his wedding, the one guy who was always there for him. After my dad got married, he and my mother left Joe and the town they were in to start a life outside of the town that they grew up in. After years of moving around California, my family eventually moved to Utah, where my father worked for a successful internet business. Joe stayed behind in Washington. Because my family were so far away from their old life with Joe, there wasn't a lot of foresight or warning that Joe had intended on self-deletion. Joe's sister apparently had been blaming Joe's wife for the whole incident. Joe and his wife drank a lot and probably as a result fought a lot. My father always said that they were a passionate couple. Yes, they would fight often, but he hardly knew two other individuals who were so completely in love. For this reason, he didn't believe it. A few days after Joe self-deleted, his widow called up my father sobbing about how she thought it was her fault. After about an hour of trying to console her, he told her, if there was a way for me to talk to Joe now, I guarantee you that he would tell you that he loved you and that it wasn't your fault what he did. Crying, she still didn't believe him, but she thanked him for the kind words and let my father go. My dad was obviously distraught after that long conversation he had been down in his office for a while, and he decided to come up and check on his kids while making a pot of coffee to take his mind off things. We were all supposed to be napping, but he thought he would peek his head into our rooms just to make sure we were safe. Maybe to try to have a little smile or a brightness added to his day. Sure enough, when my dad got to my room, I was fast asleep on my bed and had been for quite some time. He went to my brother's room, and he was also sleeping. Finally, he checks on my sister, who is sleeping as smugly as an angel. He decides to go back toward my room and the kitchen to continue making and pouring his coffee. 
As he walks by my room, he notices a whimper. He turns around and enters my room, where he finds me weeping, when two seconds ago I was fast asleep. I was five years old, and he said that the way I was crying seemed odd to him for my age. Normally, a five-year-old cries kind of drastically and overdramatically. I wasn't. I was just sitting on the side of my bed, weeping. My dad enters my room and says, Maddie, what's up? Why are you crying? It's then that I stop crying for just a moment, look up at him with tears in my eyes, and say, Rick, it's not her fault. I love her. It's not her fault. With that, I stopped crying and rolled over back into my bed and fell swiftly back to sleep. I have no memory of this happening, and I never heard the conversation. In fact, it wasn't until years later that I was even fully aware of what was going on with my dad's best friend. So it's not like I just heard them talking and repeated it. Needless to say, my dad almost needed new pants after that one. As a child, like many others, I was accompanied by an array of imaginary friends. Among these figments of my young imagination, the one I remember distinctly was a little girl named Sophie. Sophie, approximately my age at the time, between four and six, was just an ordinary girl wearing a dress and socks. The peculiar thing about her was the noticeable crook in her neck. I grew up in an old house, possibly around 80 years old, with our next door neighbor who we affectionately referred to as Grandma, and who has lived there for 60 years. This fact bears significance to the story. Sophie was my closest friend during my early years, a phenomenon not uncommon among children. We spent a lot of time talking and playing in my room, but she never ventured downstairs, claiming fear. It was a usual occurrence for me to descend the staircase, turn back and reassure her. Hey, see, it's okay, you can come down. Regardless, she would stay put, a fact I found utterly perplexing. As I aged, my interactions with Sophie dwindled, and ultimately, she faded from my memory. That was until, after relocating, my mother and I paid a visit to Grandma and began reminiscing about my childhood spent in the old house. My mother mentioned my habit of addressing the staircase when I was young, which piqued Grandma's curiosity prompting her to ask, who were you speaking to? I casually answered, oh, Sophie, and I started to describe her. Grandma fell into a silent contemplation. After a while, she said, you know, when I initially moved into this house, my neighbors were preparing to move out. Tragically, a month before their departure, their daughter slipped and fell down the staircase succumbing to her injuries. She had broken her neck. You know, I do believe her name was Sophie. In 2013, Following my amicable divorce from my wife, we both relocated to separate residences. We've remained good friends, largely due to our shared parenthood of our daughter. To ensure fair custody, I rented an appealing house located in the city's historic district. Constructed in 1935, it was well-preserved and offered a perfect home for our three-year-old daughter during her fortnightly stays with me. It was during these visits that I began to notice my daughter conversing with an unseen friend. On one occasion, I discovered her in a tiny closet, deep in conversation with a little girl that she referred to as Betty. Considering her age, I assumed this was a product of her vibrant imagination, particularly as I had no idea where she had heard the name Betty. 
As a single dad to a little girl, I struggled with some aspects of parenting, particularly tasks like hairstyling. While her mother had a knack for it, I was left floundering. One evening, I put her to bed following a bath and remember giving her a quick hairbrush, but that was the extent of my hairstyling capabilities. The following morning when my daughter was just rising, her mom came to pick her up. She discovered our daughter's hair had been transformed into flawless fringe braids. Initially, she praised me for managing such an intricate hairstyle, but I assured her that I had not, and could not, have done it. When we quizzed our daughter about her braids, she said, Betty did them during the night. Aren't they pretty? This incident prompted me to break my lease, and we moved out within the next month. Betty did not come with us. I care for my niece full time, so she's like a daughter to me. She's done some peculiar things over the years, but here are a few that stand out. Once, when she was still a toddler, I was roused from sleep by the sensation of my hair being brushed. As I opened my eyes, she simply whispered, shh, and attempted to close my eyelids, much like one might do for the deceased. On another occasion, when she was feeling under the weather, we lay in bed watching a movie. Out of the blue, amid the film, she warned, don't let your feet hang off the bed like that. The devil can grab you and pull you to hell. Given she's only five, I can only hope that she overheard that from another child at school. At least I hope so. And lastly, as I was preparing dinner one evening, she strolled nonchalantly through the kitchen and said, I'll get you, and I'll make it look like a bloody accident. It terrified me at the moment, but I later discovered that she had lifted the line from Cat in the Hat. She's a great kid, but she has definitely given me some spooks a time or two. I was babysitting my nephew, who was around four to five years old at the time. From down the hall, I heard him use the bathroom, but noticed that he didn't flush. When I inquired about it, he said, the man in my bedroom gets angry when I make noises. This was particularly unsettling, considering my sister and her husband had purchased their home from a man whose father had passed away in that very house. At the time this happened, I had recently discovered I was pregnant, and the stress was mounting. The pregnancy was unexpected, and I was apprehensive about breaking the news to the father, who happened to be my best friend's brother. One day, as I sat with my best friend in her room, her three-year-old daughter wandered in. I held back from discussing my situation in the child's presence, fearing she might inadvertently relay the news to her uncle. Opting for silence, I lay down on the bed. The little girl approached and gently placed her hand on my belly. She offered a reassuring smile and said, everything is going to be okay, before softly rubbing my abdomen. My friend and I exchanged bewildered glances. We were certain that the child had not overheard our conversation. Her room is upstairs, and she always needed supervision while climbing the steps, signaling her approach. To this day, I don't know if it was a weird coincidence, or if that little girl knew something. yet become a parent, but
but an incident involving my younger brother still unnerves me. When he was about three years old, a chilling episode took place. My mother, overseeing my two younger brothers' bath, shouted for me to fetch a towel, allowing her to maintain her watchful gaze on them. As I was about to hand over the towel, my typically incoherent speaking toddler brother abruptly sat upright. He tilted his head and, with an uncharacteristic clarity, declared, Look, Mom, I can't die. Without hesitation, he crossed his arms over his chest and slid under the water. Both my mother and I were momentarily stunned, but she swiftly plucked him out of the tub. Though he had swallowed a lot of water and was sobbing, he emerged relatively unharmed. Several years later, as we replaced the trim in my brother's room, adjacent to that very bathroom, we discovered a penciled height chart concealed behind the closet trim that connected to my parents' bedroom. The chart documented the growth of a child named Alan until the age of five. The elderly woman who had sold us the house had frequently claimed that she and her husband were the original homeowners and that they never had children. Driven by curiosity, we decided to investigate the home's history. The local library's newspaper archives unearthed a 1950s article revealing that the old couple did, in fact, have a child. Tragically, he had drowned in the same bathtub after presumably standing, slipping, and then striking his head. His name was Alan. After unearthing this connection, I could no longer bring myself to enter that bathroom, and it still unnerves me to this day. Three years ago, when I was 15 and living in my village, something happened that I rarely speak about. People often think I'm making it up, but I've thought about it a lot this week, and I want others to know. My village is nestled in a rural area protected by the government, considered a natural paradise for the past 30 years. As a result, exploration is challenging since cutting trees is forbidden which leaves a vast forest. I spent my summer there, and hiking was my favorite activity. Although I had never ventured into the woods alone, I usually stuck to populated roads, my grandma informed me that cleaning services had opened a path, long covered by trees and bushes, for an upcoming race. Normally, I would go to the nearest town about an hour's walk away by the road, but on my way back from visiting friends, I took this newly rehabilitated path alone, which turned out to be a mistake. The first part of the path was relatively easy, with obstacles and landslides, but nothing compared to what awaited. The second part was a rock-strewn hill that required me to climb like a dog on all fours. Upon reaching the top, I noticed some animal bones but thought little of them, considering the area's known wolf and bear population. I hastened my pace, relieved to find a stretch of plain floor where the woods truly began, only to encounter a dead end. Some massive trees had fallen in a row across the path, blocking passage. Oddly, beside these trees stood a small, seemingly abandoned barn in a clear field, devoid of trees, bushes, or large plants. It shouldn't have looked like that if it was truly abandoned. I grew concerned about the coincidental location of the fallen trees, the suspicious barn beside the clear field, and the fact that the path had been closed for 30 years. Something seemed really off. Continuing on, I approached the last hill my grandma had described, which led to the village. Suddenly, a silence fell, allowing me to hear branches cracking behind me. At first, I thought it was a bird, but the sound grew closer, resembling footsteps. Trying to convince myself it was an animal, I quickened my pace, and so did the footsteps. Terrified, I began to run, 
and so did whatever was behind me. I then heard incredibly loud grunts, my heart pounding as I sprinted towards safety. I reached my village in a minute or so, bursting into the patio of a relative's house and closing the door behind me, catching my breath for 10 minutes or so before returning home. Even now, recalling the place, the lack of a signal, and those haunting grunts chills me to the bone. I can't shake the feeling that something was following me, that the barn and the trees were merely distractions to slow me down. Needless to say, I never ventured into the woods alone again. Back in April of 2011, my family and I stayed in Skyline Cabin C82, the one right beside the nature trail at Jellystone Park in Lorry, Virginia. Each of us experienced something that we believed to be paranormal, but none of us admitted it to each other until we had gotten home. As it turns out, my sister, who was eight at the time, and I, who was 11, actually saw the same figure at the same time. We don't remember the time of night, but both of us recall waking up for an unknown reason, to find a tall man standing by the bed, with his arms crossed, and an angry look on his face. At first we thought the figure was my dad, and we were confused as to why he seemed angry with us. Then we realized we could see straight through the guy, to my coat hanging on the wall. I quickly rolled over to the other side of the bed in fear as my sister slowly did the same. Later that night, my sister woke up again to see the man sitting at the dining table in the other room. She turned on her flashlight to see who it was, and the figure disappeared. My mom also woke up during the night to see a white orb fly in through the window and out through the door. As soon as the light went through the window, she heard a voice scream, You don't belong here or you aren't welcome here, one of the two. Our stay at cabin C82 is something we reminisce about often, but we've always been curious if anyone else has experienced anything similar. So if you've stayed at Jellystone Park in Lori, Virginia, and experienced something paranormal, we would love to hear your story. Bonus points if it happened in cabin C82. My life was always crazy, but never did I think it was this crazy. This is my story. It was a summer day in 2011. I was 10 and my dad had gotten with his ex-girlfriend. That's a story for a different time. She had two boys. One was a year younger and the other one was older. I had a little brother as well. Now that you know the family, let me give you a little bit of background to this bone chilling story. My dad was searching for a house to rent after breaking things off with my biological mother, and he found this house, and what's crazy is that my name is Ashley, and it was off of Ashland Street. It seemed to be very cheap for the area. It was in a gated community, so of course it seemed very comfortable and safe. I mean, at least you'd think so. I moved with my dad into this house with his ex-girlfriend and her two boys, so there were four kids all together. We'll name them Kobe, the year younger, and Jerry, the older one, and then my little brother, Brandon. I have changed their names for privacy. It was an older house, so nothing brand new was built, but it was definitely pretty cheap. I mean, for a gated high middle-class neighborhood. We moved in. I don't remember the exact date, but it was in the summertime. I live in Vegas, so the heat is sometimes unbearable. One day it can be 99, and the next it's 104. My dad wakes me up and is really excited about moving out and just being free. 
My biological mother was a freeloader and a real piece of work. My dad and I picked up all our boxes and we went to the house. Now this is the first time that I was seeing it, but of course my dad did a tour with the landlord. So I went through the place, picking my bedroom and all the fun things you do when you move into a brand new house. I shared a room with my baby brother, Brandon. He was like four or five at the time, so really young. I got the room I wanted, I guess out of the three I could have picked. It was a four bedroom, three bathroom house, two upstairs and one downstairs. The first night wasn't anything out of the ordinary. We got Little Caesars Pizza and watched Cops, my dad's favorite TV show. We went to bed and woke up like normal and went on about our day. Again, still really normal, nothing crazy. The second night was just as normal. It was about a week into living in the house when things started to happen. It was almost like the ghosts wanted to make sure we stayed or something. How sweet. So it was more like night eight and I was walking up the stairs. I was alone in the house and the stairs had carpet. I walked up them and I swear I kept hearing somebody walking behind me. But every time I would turn around, nothing would be there. I just kind of kept it to myself and told myself I was just paranoid for being at the new house by myself. I was the type of kid that was scared of the dark, and I still get scared easily to this day. I actually hate Halloween for that very reason. But these strange things just kept happening. The first spirit sighting was Kobe's birthday. He got a new spyware truck thing where you can put a camera on the toy truck and go around the house. It's kind of like a GoPro. Well, we decided to pull a prank on Jerry, so we put the camera in his room to prank him. He was asleep, so he would wake up and freak out that there was a camera. I mean, we were all under 12, so it was really funny to us, but that's not all I caught. I know the typical white woman in a white robe thing, I get it, but it was true. All we could see was a silhouette of a young woman, probably in her late 20s or early 30s, standing over him. Of course, as the two young boys were so sweet, they had me go up to check myself. So of course I went upstairs, a little spooked, but trying not to overthink it. And I went into his room. Jerry was still asleep and there was no woman in there. So I came downstairs and told myself that there's probably a glitch in the camera that just made it seem like somebody was there. So we all let it go. As some of you probably know, when you move into a house, especially an older one, the floor creaks and you might hear bumps in the night just because the furniture is settling, but only squeaks and creaks for a day or two. We kept hearing this noise almost like somebody was walking up and down the stairs all the time. But again, we all just put it out of our heads and said that it was the house settling. Maybe something fell. No matter what, we would try to find an explanation for the situation. But over time, it just got worse. My dad had signed an 18 month lease agreement, but we only stayed there for four because this is when things got absolutely crazy. I went off to school. I was in the fifth grade. I had to repeat the second grade, hence why I was in the fifth grade at 10 years old. Anyway, my school was definitely a walkable distance, so I walked to school and back home. I got home one day and my dad's girlfriend was at work and so was my dad. Kobe and Jerry were at their grandma's and Brandon was still in school so I was all alone in the house. When I walked in, it was like something out of a horror movie. Picture this, you get home from a stressful day at school and when you open the door, it literally looks like somebody has robbed the place. The stove was on. Yes, the stove, like literal fire, was on. Of course, my immediate reaction was to call my dad and tell him what was going on. As I got into the kitchen, all the cabinet doors were open and most of the plates were on the ground, shattered. There was glass everywhere, even on the carpet. Thank God we didn't have any animals at the time. 
My dad, of course, got home with the cops, and the cops came in and did an investigation, all to find out that there was no foul play, so there was nothing anybody could really do. So, of course, my dad's now ex-girlfriend blames me, but I told her that I didn't do it, that I came home to this. Unfortunately, my dad played right into her crap and believed her, so I was grounded for breaking her plates and causing a fire. I was so mad, but I was 10. What was I going to do, run away? I kept trying to convince my dad that I didn't do this, but pretty soon, he wouldn't need any convincing. While we were all downstairs playing and talking one day, upstairs in my parents' bedroom, there were three loud booms, all at one after the other, just boom, boom, boom. My dad and his now ex and myself all ran up the stairs to find that my parents' bed was broken. It almost looked like somebody had jumped on it really hard, and that's how it broke. The mattress was caved into the bed frame. I just looked at my dad with a cocky attitude and said, so did I do that too? My dad actually apologized to me that night, but not his girlfriend. She never liked me, but that was another story, like I said. Under the staircase, we had storage. The door to that slammed, but the AC unit was close by the door. So I just thought that maybe somebody had left it open and the wind had pushed it shut. It wasn't a very heavy door. The next night was definitely one of the scariest nights of my life. It was around 8 p.m. and we were all settling down for the night. I had school the next morning as everybody was going to bed. It was around 10 going on 11. As I was about to sit on the bed, I heard two knocks on the door. I could see a shadowy impression of feet under the door. So when I opened it, it was confusing to see nobody there. I closed it again, thinking that it had to be one of my brothers playing a mean trick on me. Again, I scare easily, so that was their thing. I heard the knocks again, and like the first time, I opened it. But nothing was there, and I didn't hear anybody run away. I went to Kobe's room. He was fast asleep. Then I went to Jerry's room, but he was still awake. He told me he didn't knock or anything, and that he'd been in his room the whole entire time, but I didn't really believe him. I had no choice to just go back to my room and try to relax. Probably about another hour went by, with nothing, no knocking or anything, but just as I had closed my eyes, I heard it again. I stood right by my door for about 10 minutes until the knocking happened again, and I immediately opened the door. Absolutely nothing. And then, in the silent darkness, I heard a giggle. I looked around the corner, and there was nothing there. Everybody was asleep, and nobody would have had time to get back to their bedroom. I just went to bed. I wanted it to be over so badly. The next morning, I tried to tell my dad what was happening, but he said I was just dreaming. I looked at him and said, so was the kitchen and the fire and the bed. That was all a dream too, right? Because we're all either having some really crazy Jumanji stuff happening or there's more to it. My dad just shrugged it all off and told me to get ready for school. So I did. Probably about another week later, I ended up staying the night at a friend's house. I'll call her Emma, just again for privacy reasons. So after school, I took the bus back to Emma's house. I decided to confide in her about what had been going on. Her mother was a medium, so I guess she could like speak to the souls that hadn't crossed over or something, or as she would say, departed. When I came in close contact with her, she looked at me with fear in her eyes. It was like she knew what was going on before I even told her. She told me that I had a very negative soul attached to me. It was a female soul. And all I could think was maybe it was my dad's ex or even my biological mother. Two really horrible females. But she said that it wasn't anybody I knew closely. And that's when I started to piece everything together. The woman standing over the bed. The fire. The bed breaking. The knocking. The giggling. It somehow all made sense in some way. This spirit was stuck. But my question was how did she get there in the first place? My dad picked me up the morning after 
and I discussed with him what I had kind of put together. He said maybe the landlord would know more, so I told my dad to give him a call and tell him the pipe was loose or something so he could come over and have a conversation. You know, trick him, I guess. If he doesn't want to go into detail about it, he's definitely not going to over the phone. My dad agreed, and a few hours later, the landlord arrived. My dad called me downstairs, and we decided to go over everything with him, from the fire, to the glass, to the bed breaking, to the woman standing over the bed. All the color drained from his face, and I immediately knew that he knew something. As we were all talking downstairs in the living room, there was this mirror on the wall in front of us over the television. We're sitting on the couch, and as I looked up, I saw a lady wearing a very tall, almost like black witch hat, and she had very long gray hair. She just looked off, like I knew from somewhere, but didn't at the same time. Of course, I reacted very startled, and my dad told me to relax. Like, yeah, dad, let me just relax while all this stuff keeps happening. Why don't I just tell the ghost to make us a campfire as well? He didn't find it funny and sent me to my room. The landlord eventually left and fewer questions were answered. It was like he didn't want to say anything. Like our house almost blew up into flames and there was glass all over the kitchen. This isn't the time for secrets. Anyway, we looked up the address on a background search for properties and we only found two things that could have been connected to this haunting. The first thing was that the entire neighborhood had been built on a Native American burial ground, but that seemed a little cliché, so we kept digging. And then we found something even sadder. A young couple was there. They had lived there once. They had two children. One day, out of nowhere, the dad came home drunk. He shot his wife and two kids, and then set the house on fire and shot himself. Unfortunately, the house did burn to the ground and their remains were never found, so nobody knew who they were. It made total sense. The fire that started, the loud booms, the knocking. It was a sick memory that I'll never forget. I really hope that family rests in peace. At least the wife and the kids. I can't imagine being taken out like that by your own father and husband. Anyway... That was the haunted house on Ashland Street. I have never been back since we moved out, and I'll never go back again. My family and I were en route to a beach in San Diego cruising along the freeway. At the time, I was around 15 or 16 years old. With music in my ears, I found myself gazing up at the clouds through the car window. Suddenly, I spotted an odd triangular-shaped black object high in the sky. Given the cloud cover, it was somewhat challenging to keep my eyes on it as it moved. At first, I rationalized that it might be a plane. After all, it's pretty rare to spot UFOs in broad daylight. But as I observed its movements, I began to find its trajectory odd. The object seemed to have its pointed end facing downward, and it was gradually descending toward the ground. Trying to reassure myself, I considered other possibilities, like a weather balloon. But then a thought struck me. Don't planes typically maintain their altitude? rather than fly downward, we were nowhere near an airport. As our car journeyed onward and the clouds shifted, I lost sight of the object for a brief moment. Thinking that was the last I would see of it, I was taken aback when I located it again, descending more rapidly than before. Just as I contemplated alerting my family to this sight, the object halted its descent abruptly. To my astonishment, it rocketed upwards at an incredible speed, disappearing from my view. Excitedly, I recounted my observation to my family. In response, my father gestured to a formation of jets that suddenly appeared, racing across the sky in the direction the UFO had been. 
That detail seemed odd, yet at the time I didn't dwell on it too much. To this day, I remain thoroughly puzzled about whatever it was I witnessed. My boyfriend and I had planned a camping trip in Canton, Oklahoma for October 27th through the 28th of 2018. We arrived at our campsite late in the afternoon and began our usual setup. Unloading the truck, pitching the tent, arranging the chairs around the fire pit, and stacking firewood. I was particularly excited for the evening fire because we had bought this massive log with a central hole soaked in a long burning solution. Once we'd tossed our cozy gear into the tent and set up our lights and speaker, we lounged around the fire pit. We chatted and listened to music as the sun descended. As night settled, my boyfriend lit the fire using the impressive log I had been so excited about. However, as darkness enveloped us, our speaker began emitting a strange, loud, glitchy static on several occasions, something it had never done before. We speculated that the spotty internet or the distance between the phone and speaker might be causing the issue. Despite our decent cell service, we couldn't discern the cause. The erratic static unnerved me, and although my boyfriend didn't voice it, I sensed it bothered him too. To distract ourselves, we decided to dig into our Fritos and bean dip and play with the glow sticks that we had brought. I recall a particularly vivid moment when, as we sat across from each other at the picnic table, my boyfriend crafted glasses from a pack of glow sticks, humorously placing the connector piece in his nostrils, mimicking oxygen tubes. We burst into laughter, but strangely, the next thing I remember is waking up inside the tent, snugly cocooned into a sleeping bag. My boyfriend was shivering, asking if we could share the bag. We exchanged bewildered glances, grappling with our sudden dislocation from the picnic table to the tent. Our mutual confusion only grew as we discussed our last memory, his playful act with the glow stick connector and our shared laughter. That unsettling feeling intensified when I couldn't find my jeans. Out of nowhere, a vivid memory flashed. I was at the picnic table, distressed, trying to remove large thorns from my jeans. My boyfriend was there trying to comfort and assist me. When I shared this with him, he initially brushed it off as a dream. However, my insistence and the discovery of the thorns on my shoelaces triggered his own recollection of the event. Stepping outside the tent, the scene was eerily familiar and untouched. A lone Frito in the bean dip, unbroken glow sticks, and the pack with the connector piece. The fire had burned through all of our wood, and the morning was unusually quiet. The manicured lawns around us made the presence of thorns on my shoes even more perplexing. One odd consolation, I guess, my boyfriend, a former 82nd Airborne Infantry paratrooper who usually woke up with daily pain, felt none that morning. Were we abducted? Were we fleeing from something? What caused our memory gap? While we both believe in extraterrestrial life, we're unsure if this experience can be attributed to that. This encounter has intensified my fear of the dark, and I have vowed to never tent camp again. To this day, neither of us have recovered any further memories from that night, and part of me wonders if it's better that way. I'm 22, currently in the military, and I was an army brat until I was 12. I moved all the time, overseas twice and to 10 different states. I lived a very unusually unstable life because of this. My first life memory that I can recall, I was six. 
My father was stationed in Fort Sill. We lived in Lawton and this tiny brick house, very old and creepy. I recall going to take a bath before I went to bed and I saw this odd sort of organic amoeba-shaped fluorescent transparent green thing just a few feet above the bathroom tile. It floated out and disappeared. I was genuinely unconcerned and thought that I was tired. I go to bed and in the middle of the night, this thing woke me up and had me follow it down the hallway. It leads me to the living area where I kid you not, the whole house is full of fluorescent, transparent green people dressed in like 1800 type clothing. I'm six at the time, so how do I even know what period clothing looks like? I couldn't tell you. I was older when I finally saw an old Western movie and recognized the clothes. These people looked at me, watched me intently and were very still. One man stood up and began walking toward me. I remember leaving and going back to bed, scared as heck and pulling the blankets over my head. Enter the rest of my life until around the time I turned 20. From this day on, every night for several years, I would have the same dream about these things. I would ignore it. I never again followed the thing if it came for me. I didn't want to know what would happen. I was an odd, quiet kid, and I guess I just accepted that it would be this way. I didn't tell my parents for a very long time. When I got used to the dreams and the thing, I firmly believed it began manifesting itself in different ways. For instance, if I left my bedroom and shut the door behind me, the door would unlatch and pop back open, as if somebody was behind me and needed to open the door again to follow me. My father can even confirm this to this day, and he's a complete skeptic. My belongings always moved around and would be found in odd places. The lights would be on, the doors would open. It drove my parents nuts. My best friend, we'll call her T, dubbed this very masculine presence of mine, Ed. T and I have been friends for eight years now, and she definitely had to accept Ed as well. As I got older and began driving, Ed would ride in the back seat of my car. I could hear him adjust in his seat, or the occasional arm resting on the door. It sounded as if somebody was just casually riding in the back seat. Once I was driving to a nearby town at night and I got tired. I almost veered off the road, but something shook my shoulder and woke me up. Maybe Ed is evil or just incredibly protective. For example, we had a rabid dog in our neighborhood once that I encountered while on a walk. This dog, foaming at the mouth, came up to me. Once it got close, it's like he got hit hard by something. Not enough to really hurt him, but just enough to get him to go away. He ducked and kind of yelped and scampered off quickly. I could never see the source of what this was. Another occasion, I had gotten mad at Ed for moving some of my things and while going to the fridge during dinner, my whole family watched the light fixture above my head explode and shatter. Right as I said, Ed needs to get the heck out of my life. Luckily, I was the only one hurt and I only needed two stitches. T has some interesting stories as well, as Ed didn't always want her around. Ed only got really scary whenever we moved, or really when I moved. When I packed my things, that's when it got bad. By bad, I mean whenever we were getting ready to move again, things began happening to slow down the process. When we went from Sill to Vilsack, Germany, the power in our house repeatedly went out. Two of my boxes opened and unpacked themselves onto the floor and our house was broken into and many things were stolen. This would become a pattern every single time we started to move. On top of that, every time we arrived somewhere new, I could feel that Ed wasn't anywhere near us from about three days to two weeks. And then he would show up. It was almost as though he had to do his own traveling to catch up. For whatever reason, Ed left me in March of 2017. 
I lived in an old house in Montana, in downtown Helena, a very historic mining town. The house was built in 1889. It was a duplex. I rented one unit, and I lived there alone for much of the time. I had a boyfriend who I dated for a long time, and we lived together for some time. He knew of Ed, and while he never wanted to discuss it, he was also not really bothered by it. The day we broke up, and the day he moved out and never came back, I sat in the living room crying, and I said out loud to Ed that I needed to be alone. I basically begged him to leave. I heard an odd noise. It was like a choked cry. Maybe a cough or a sigh, I couldn't really place it. And then, things suddenly felt empty and quiet, like I had more space. I remember never feeling this way except for those short times after a move when Ed wasn't there. That's how I knew Ed had left. Ed has never returned. It's been years now, and part of me still wonders if this terrifying thing will one day come back. I never say his name out loud. I don't bring him up, and no one that knows of him says a thing. We all just know. I lived with this thing for a long, long time. He followed me to basic training, too. I often wonder what Ed was. He held power over me, preferred me to treat him in a certain way. If I ever spoke badly of him, he retaliated. Although, I only did that by accident a time or two. On other occasions, he protected me. I know how crazy all of this sounds. That's why only a handful of people in my personal life ever knew about Ed. All of us still really wonder what in the world he was. For context, I live in Germany. My boyfriend's childhood home is old. How old, nobody knows exactly. It might have been built around the beginning of the 20th century, but it could be older. It's a three-level house with a huge archway at the first floor that marks its age. There are two stories I want to tell you. The first one happened when we had just started dating. My boyfriend had searched for his room key for quite a while. It appeared to be lost forever. One day I entered his room and there was the key, laying perfectly placed in the middle of the bed. When he came home from work, I mentioned that I was glad he had found his key. He looked at me confused and I pointed at the door where I put the key in. He said, I never found it. Later we asked his parents and sister if they had placed it there, but they denied it. To this day, we don't know how it ended up there. The second story happened pretty recently. The building has two front doors. The inner front door squeaks remarkably if you open it, so everyone knows when somebody's coming inside. My boyfriend's mother and I sat at the dinner table. His dad was watching soccer on the TV next to us on the third floor. My boyfriend and his sister were out of the house. Suddenly, my mother-in-law and I heard the front door. Then another door-like sound. Oh, someone must have come in, my mother-in-law said. She went down the first stair and said, hello. No answer. She decided to take a look herself. Not a single soul in sight. At the exact moment she went down to look, my boyfriend opened the door and came in, just to see the two of us confused. We asked if he was mocking us. He affirmed that he hadn't even been inside before, so the door wasn't him. He and his mom both told me that these kinds of things have happened to them before. Doors open, things move, sometimes you hear steps that aren't supposed to be there. Apparently they call their ghost Herbert, after their uncle that passed away a few years ago. I guess it's a friendly soul.
I was little, like kindergarten starting first grade little. I lived in Germany at the time due to being an army brat. My little sister is two years younger than me, so we did everything together. We lived in a two-story farmhouse style home, and my little sister and I were playing in our room. I don't remember when he came, but we started playing with a boy a little bit older than us. I don't remember ever seeing him, just talking to him and playing games and other kid stuff. It was like he kind of just appeared. My sister and I would later realize that the little farm boy was kind of a jerk, because he would turn off the lights in whatever room we were in, mostly our bedroom, and lock the doors. We would find each other in the dark, scared, but also a little bit annoyed. I remember telling my sister to try to find the light, and I would get the door. They were both next to each other. I couldn't open the door, so I began to bang on it, when my sister, in a panicked voice, said that she couldn't find the light. I was kind of mad scared, and I thought that she was pulling my leg. And she was small, so I was like, move over, let me try. I felt around the area where I know the light switch was, but all I found was a wall. Confused, I decided to find the bottom of the wall, use both of my hands, and just slide them all the way up as high as I could. Nothing. I then told my sister to do what I had just done, and I would do the same at the top. But we would do kind of a slow zigzag pattern just in case we weren't going far enough. Our hands eventually grazed each other, and we realized we couldn't find a thing. There was no light switch. So I turned back to the door, and I ordered my little sister to start banging on the door and screaming. We did this for what felt like forever. I was even more confused, because mom should be making dinner right now, and dad would be getting home soon, or he already was. My other older sisters were never home, so they weren't on my list of rescuers. My little sister and I started to give up, thinking that this was just our life now, in the dark next to the door. We weren't about to go into the abyss behind us. Then, all of a sudden, our mom came to the door, and we shouted that we were stuck. Dad got us out, and my little sister and I were pissed. We thought they were being mean and meant to do that to us. We started saying, didn't you hear us? We were shouting and banging on the door. They looked confused and said, we never heard anything. We told them about the farm boy and that we didn't want to play with him if he kept doing that. We actually played with that boy until we left, and I'm still quite miffed about some of the things that he did. But looking back on it, I don't know. That's one heck of a prank, right? I'm starting to wonder what that boy was really up to, if he was even a little boy at all. This was back in 2006. A group of friends and I decided to spend the weekend in Germany to watch some of the World Cup games in the local town squares of Frankfurt. We flew in from the UK. Things go as expected, lots of beer and lots of fun. The evening is getting really late and we find ourselves struggling to find any more bars open at the time. We end up walking a bit and we find ourselves at the river. We decide to walk along it to see if we come across any place that's open. It's mostly just trees, grass, and small parks. It was clear that we weren't going to find anywhere here to get a drink. We rounded a corner, and all of a sudden there are these huge tents with music playing, a good amount of people, and beer being served. Great, we hit the jackpot. So we all find a table. It wasn't a waitress-style venue. More like a mini festival vibe, so I offer to go buy drinks at the bar and bring them back. The girl at the bar asks me what I'd like, in German. She realizes that I am English from my terrible German and we start chatting in English. After a few exchanges, she says that she wants to introduce me to someone and to follow her behind the bar. So I follow her and we walk behind the bar and out behind the tent. 
It's quite a large open space with no one else there except a group of guys in the back corner of this grassy area. She walks straight toward these guys and introduces me to them with something along the lines of, hey, this guy is English too. I think you'll get along. She then turns around and walks back to where we'd come from, leaving me with these guys. I say hello and we start small talking. I can't really remember what about, where I'm from in England and why I'm in Germany, things like that. Turns out these guys are from the same town as where one of the friends that I'm with is from. I end up chatting with them for what seems like an hour or so to the point where I completely lost track of time. That's when my friend finds me. I see him walking across the grass from the tent. He says they're about ready to leave and to come on with them. I say sure, but just before we leave, let me introduce you to my new friends as they're from your town. He says hello and asks where about in the town they live. It turns out they live on the same street as one of my friend's uncles. My friend asks per chance if he knows his uncle and the guy says, yeah, actually, it's his dad. Now both of these guys realize that they're first cousins. My original friend's dad isn't in his life anymore and he doesn't ever have any contact with that side of the family, but obviously knows who they are. So it kind of makes sense that these guys have never met each other before, but they know who each other are once they connected the dots. Anyway, they chit chat a bit, exchange numbers, and they still keep in touch to this day. As we're walking away from the group, my friend asks me why I decided to go up to these guys in particular and strike up a conversation. So I tell him about the girl behind the bar who wanted to introduce us. That's when he looks at me really weirdly and explains that he watched me go to the bar to get drinks. According to him, it looked like I was speaking to nobody. And then I just wandered through to the back area behind the bar. It was fully open so he could see through. And I walked directly over to this group of guys and then stood there talking for that hour. My friends ended up deciding to leave me to it and just got drinks themselves until they were ready to leave. To this day, my friends do not believe me that there was any girl or third party there. To them, I just walked up to a bar, spoke to no one, and then walked up to a random group of guys in a reasonably busy beer tent away from the main area. And then one of them ended up being my friend's first cousin. Since I was making a big deal about how there was definitely somebody that introduced us, otherwise why would I hone in on a bunch of strangers and start chatting, my friend ended up calling his cousin to ask him exactly what happened. Apparently, I did just walk up to them with no one else there and start chatting. They found it a bit weird, but they just went with it. Now, I don't know if it's a glitch or what, but it's really odd especially because we're in a different country. If we were in the same town or even anywhere in the UK, it might not have been that weird and I could have explained it away, but we hadn't bumped into any other British people the entire weekend. Anyway, I've always dwelled on this and I just refuse to accept that there wasn't somebody who introduced us. I remember it vividly. And I know that being drunk doesn't help me and it makes me question my version of events too, but I remember this person. I mean, I've gone drinking a lot and I've never hallucinated before, so I honestly don't know how to explain it. When I was 15, I traveled to Europe with my family. We stayed in Etal, Germany, in a small inn for a few nights. My parents had a double bed on the second floor. My sisters had the double bedroom next to theirs, and I was lucky enough to have a single bedroom all to myself at the far end of the hall. When we went to check into our rooms, as soon as I entered the hallway our rooms were in, I remember almost feeling as though I walked into a wall of bad energy. I just felt so unnerved and uneasy in that hallway, but I passed it off as an overactive imagination. 
I slept the first night without any issues, other than waking up a few times. The next morning at breakfast, one of my sisters mentioned feeling really uncomfortable in the hallway, almost as if the air was crushing. It unnerved me even more that I wasn't the only one who felt weirded out. Plus, she was an adult at the time, so it further cemented in my head that that wing of the hotel was odd. Later that night, I'm sleeping peacefully, when at about two o'clock in the morning, I'm awoken by something ripping the covers off of me and being jerked about two feet toward the end of the bed by my ankles. At first, I thought somebody had broken into my room, because when I turned toward what had grabbed me, a huge looming black shape was visible in the darkness. It was like a man was in my room. I frantically flipped on the light, only for nothing to be there. The window was locked from the inside, and there was nobody in the closet or the bathroom. My room was also still locked from the inside. I stayed up the rest of the night, scared, playing games on my DS. The next morning we're at breakfast, and my sister mentions that she was up half the night because she thought she saw a person silhouetted against the wall of the room, but when she turned on the light there was nobody there. It was just a bizarre and creepy experience. We checked out that day, so I never got to experience anything after that, but it still freaks me out to this day. For the past two weeks, my family and I have been traveling around various countries in Europe. Unfortunately, we had our passports stolen in Belgium and had to make a couple last minute changes to our plans, one of which included booking a hotel in a new city for one night. We stopped just for the night between trains in Cologne, Germany. I helped my parents find the last minute reservation online and it was a pretty standard apartment style rental. When we arrived at the rental, we were all impressed by the views of the nearby cathedral and church spires, the shingled roofs, just the general feel of history that the whole town had. We went out for dinner and came back after dark, all heading to bed for our early train the next morning. I shared a room with my little brother, and my parents slept in the next room over. I remember asking them if we could swap rooms, because I didn't like the layout of ours. There were way too many doors for me to feel comfortable. I have a weird thing where I don't like sleeping near doors, and I can't sleep in a room with any doors left open. Anyway, they said no, we could just stay in the original room, which had doors to the kitchen, hallway, and two closets. I was too tired to push it, and I figured my fatigue would override my personal habits, so I just got ready for bed and tried to go to sleep. While I was sleeping, I remember having some cycles of regular dreams. Then all of a sudden, I woke up within another dream. I was lying in the same bed, in the exact same room, and my little brother was lying in the same bed too. It felt exactly as though I had just woken up normally. Now I have very vivid dreams sometimes, but I've never dreamed about being in the exact room I'm in and I've never woken up to a dream within a dream. In this dream, I was sitting up in bed and so was my brother. I could feel that for some reason, we were both very scared and there was this charged and anxious feeling in the room. I remember my little brother saying, what is that? Get out your flashlight. At the same time, we were both looking at the far end of the room where it was darker and away from the windows. It was like we were both almost too scared to speak, but I could feel that we were both sensing whatever dark energy was at the end of the room. I started to fumble for my phone flashlight, just for some light, when all of a sudden this thing, the closest I can describe it as is a dark blob of energy, moved super quickly over next to my side of the bed. My brother and I screamed at the same time as this thing rushed up next to me. That's exactly when I woke up for real, at about 2.30 in the morning. 
My heart was racing, and I was sweating so hard, despite the room not being hot at all. I was so unsettled that I turned on all the lights in the room, and I didn't sleep for about two more hours, until I could finally somewhat relax, and drifted back to sleep finally. This experience was very disturbing for me. I never wake up early in the morning for no reason, as I usually sleep through the night, and I rarely, if ever, have nightmares. Like I said, I have vivid dreams, but they're usually not bad. I'm wondering if anybody has ever had a phenomenon like this, or if you know what it's called. Can people have paranormal encounters in their sleep while in certain spaces? Was I just having a really vivid nightmare? Or was that experience a signal that something bad was in that room? I worked at a restaurant located in a remote town in Michigan. Do you recall that show Ghost Hunters? Well, they actually investigated our place a few years back. From what I've been told, there are two spirits here, a little girl and a man. On my first day, curious about the ghostly rumors linked to the TV show's visit, I asked a coworker about it. As she was leaving the room, she casually mentioned, Oh yeah, there's a little girl ghost here. Just as she said that, something knocked the tool we used to retrieve pizzas from the oven right to the floor. Months later, that same coworker shared another eerie tale. She claimed the spirit would turn on the radio even when it was unplugged. I was skeptical, until one particular incident. It was a bustling Friday evening with karaoke in full swing making the restaurant quite noisy. Directly above us is an old, condemned apartment, perpetually vacant. Out of nowhere, we heard a series of thunderous steps coming from the ceiling, as if something was charging across that room. Suddenly, an entire stack of full-length hotel pans, each measuring about three feet by one foot and eight inches deep, were violently thrown off the shelf in our kitchen. The resulting clatter was deafening, like a cacophony of stainless steel crashing down onto tile floor. These pans, stacked together, must have weighed around 40 pounds. Just moments before this chaos, I had called out to the manager across the room, asking, did you hear that? About the thundering upstairs. I had this gut feeling that it was the ghost. The restaurant was loud, but the noise above was unmistakably distinct. Before he could even nod in acknowledgement, the stack of pans was flung to the floor. The most chilling part? Our 18-year-old dishwasher was directly in front of the shelf and witnessed the pans being hurled. The shock on her face was something I will never forget. In all, four of us heard the phantom footsteps. One saw the pans being thrown by nothing and several others were startled by the clamor. Given what I've experienced, it's hard for me to remain skeptical. The only other explanation might be a very elaborate prank, but that seems even more far-fetched given the people that I work with. I haven't recounted this tale in some time, so let me give you a bit of background. Between 2003 and 2005, while completing my college education, I worked the off-shift IT role at a historic federal building in Michigan that operated 24-7. This wasn't just any building. Dating back to the 1800s, it had served various purposes, such as a sanitarium and a hospital. The facility even had its own subterrain tunnels used for transporting supplies and, more eerily, bodies, reminiscent of train stations and old cemeteries. On my shift, 
I primarily worked in two areas, the call center and a secured communications room. The latter was situated in the building's sub-basement, which previously functioned as a morgue. Even though the comms room operated 24-7, with the lights always on, it perpetually felt as if unseen eyes were watching. The room's sensitive nature meant that no one could be in there alone. During the day, a minimum of three personnel occupied the room, while at night, on my shift, it was just two of us. One particular night, as I was engrossed in my homework, I heard a peculiar noise. It sounded like something heavy being dragged on the opposite side of my cubicle wall. I beckoned my coworker, who also caught the unsettling sound. We wondered if any unscheduled work was going on or if someone else was in our secured zone. But after checking, the answer was clear. It was just us. Every door was locked. No one had entered or left. Spooked, we took a brief break outside, for our own sanity more than anything else. Oddities were not confined to the comms room. Many reported unsettling experiences in the restrooms, like an invisible hand tugging at their clothes. But perhaps the most unnerving part of my job was navigating the vast gothic structure in the darkness while updating computers. The security guards had a habit of turning off lights in unoccupied sections, and I would invariably switch them back on during my rounds. Occasionally, as the lights flickered on, I would see fleeting shadows or hear soft murmurs emanating from seemingly nowhere. While the building bustled with life and noise during the day, masking its eerie history, nighttime was a different story. When it was just me and another colleague, every creak and whisper amplified our fears. For what it's worth, the building is still in use today. However, I've heard that many of those eerie sections are now merely storage spaces, inaccessible to most. I hope that sharing my experiences provided some insight, or at least a good story. Over the years, several friends and I have experienced an odd phenomenon while traveling around the state. We live in Michigan, by the way. On multiple occasions, we have inexplicably lost hours, and we've never been able to determine why. Sometimes I was alone, and other times a friend was with me. One of the most vivid instances, from approximately seven years ago, still unnerves me. Back then, I was living in Flint, Michigan, with my parents, about a year before relocating to Grand Haven. My friend and I decided to go camping in the Beulah, Frankfurt area, a journey that typically took between three to three and a half hours. We were no strangers to this route. We had made this trip numerous times over the years, especially since my family owned a lake house on Platte Lake, and we spent every summer there during my childhood. Wanting to maximize our time, we left Flint at three in the morning, hoping to get in some early morning fly fishing upon our arrival. Roughly two thirds of the way on M115, just north of Cadillac, a peculiar calm enveloped the surroundings. Now, M115 runs through a national forest, so tranquility is the norm, but this calm was different. It was almost eerie. The early morning sun began to cast its first light, slowly illuminating the surroundings. Before we knew it, we were nearing the US 31 intersection in Benzonia. A glance at the car's clock showed 12 p.m., a detail my friend also observed. Doubting the car's clock, I checked my cell phone, which confirmed the time. Even a bank sign we passed displayed the same. The reality was hard to grasp. We had anticipated our arrival around 6 to 6.30 a.m., 
but here we were, six hours behind schedule. Fatigue wasn't to blame. I had had ample sleep the previous day, and with over 120,000 miles driven annually, I was accustomed to long hauls. Plus, both of us were well acquainted with the route. Our gas tank was still nearly full, indicating we hadn't just been driving aimlessly. Checking our credit card statements later, we found no gas charges during the missing hours. The truck's mileage aligned for the expected distance of our trip. What's most baffling is how seamless the time loss felt. We had no memory of any extended stops or detours. Our journey, by all accounts, felt typical in duration, but the clocks told a different story. I grew up in an apartment complex for the first six years or so. It's been so long that I don't really remember it, but I know that I lived in an apartment complex near Meyer. We ended up moving into my grandmother's house with her after my grandfather passed away, and I remember some disturbances at a young age. The first time I ever had something paranormal happen was when I was helping my mom and grandma clean out my grandpa's old room, so then my mother and I could use it as our room. I was scared to be alone as a kid, so I slept in my mom's room. They had separate rooms. My grandma had converted one of the living rooms into her bedroom. One day, we were taking a break from cleaning the room. We were hanging out in my grandma's room, and I can't remember what it was exactly. Still, my mom asked me to go to my grandpa's room to grab something that she'd forgotten. It may have been a drink. As I walk toward his room, I hear the most ghostly moan I have ever heard in my life. It was almost like something out of Scooby-Doo. I ran back to my mom and grandma, and they said that I was just being silly. The typical answer that a child would always get from adults after telling a story like that. And my mom was an atheist who tried to explain and debunk everything she could. Occasionally, I would hear stuff, see shadows, and feel like someone was watching me. Still, I was never genuinely bothered by anything. My grandma would have liked to think that it was my grandpa just messing around, but I was never really sure. I just knew that things were happening that I couldn't explain, and I didn't like it. As a kid, I loved horror games. I loved watching scary movies and stuff like Ghost Hunters, which did scare me and kept me up some nights. Still, it was always interesting to me because I believed my house was haunted, but I liked to pretend that it wasn't so I could sleep at night. My mom died November 5th of 2006, and ever since that day, things got weird. And the feelings of being watched Noises and shadows increased, but nothing really significant. I thought it was because my grandma had like six cats, so they were probably just messing things up. One night in particular that I remember was when my friend came over to spend the night. We played video games, and he in particular loved to talk to me about his dreams because they were so creative and vivid that they could have been comic books. Well, we went to sleep, and before that, I closed my bedroom door, because one of the cats would always come in the room and wake us up by licking plastic for like an hour straight. Almost suddenly, out of a dead sleep, I woke up. No reason behind it, I just did. I'm drawn to look at the bedroom door as it slowly opens, and an almost pitch black cloud hovers into my room, staying close to the ceiling. As that's happening, my friend is yelling in his sleep, No! Stop! At this time, not only am I scared beyond belief, but I have the strangest, most eerie feeling that I have ever felt. I was so afraid, but simultaneously so tired, that I just covered my face with my blanket. 
I eventually passed out and woke up the next day. Everything is seemingly normal. I asked my friend about that night, and he said he didn't see, feel, or hear anything. When I asked him about his dream, he said, I actually can't remember it. That struck me as absolutely wild, because this guy would always tell me about how cool his dreams were. I mean, he remembered all of them. There were other things I can remember. My dad one night said that he was intoxicated and opened his door to go upstairs to grab some food out of the fridge when he said he ran into my mom as he walked out of the door and as he stumbled back and looked, he said nobody was there. But from his face and how sobering of an experience it was, I couldn't see how he would make that up. However, all of us would occasionally hear my mom's voice calling out to us, and I would freeze and look in every direction, trying to find where it came from. Fast forward to about 2013, a year or so before I eventually moved out of the house. My grandmother's health and brain were deteriorating rapidly until she finally called 911 and went to the ER, where she was diagnosed with brain and lung cancer almost identical to what my mom had when she passed. After what seemed to be a month, she passed away. And ever since that day, that house was not the same. It was odd before then, but after that, it went from 20 to 100. Stuff being knocked over, voices echoing from the hallways and basement, loud voices talking from other rooms when you were alone in the house, people coughing right in your ear, shadows walking down the hall, doors being slammed in the basement. The list goes on and on. I had a friend move into my house who always told me that when he went downstairs to shower, somebody would shake the bathroom door handle while he was in there. He said that he would open it multiple times to find nobody on the other side. However, he was still trying to figure out how I was doing it until one day he realized that I wasn't, because I had another friend come over to my house because he wanted help dyeing his hair. The friend who had his hair dyed went downstairs to take a shower, and when he came back upstairs, my buddy and I were playing video games. He walked in and said, okay, how the heck did you guys get up here so fast without making a noise? We were puzzled as heck, until he told us that somebody kept shaking the door handle. My other friend went pale and told him exactly what had been happening to him. At that point, we were all pretty freaked out and left the house for a bit. He stopped coming over as much, and honestly, I don't blame him. He vowed to never shower at my home again. Between hearing doors in the basement and seeing shadows, my dad kept telling me that when he was home alone, he would just hear my mom and grandma screaming his name from other parts of the house, which he says drove him back into alcoholism. If you're squeamish about animals, you might want to skip this next sentence. But one morning, I woke up to find my grandma's last cat had died shortly before we moved out. When I say the intensity of these encounters got worse, I mean it. All my friends that came over just said the house did not feel right, and they didn't feel welcome. We would always hear voices or cats meowing, even though by this point all of the cats had passed. I would go into my basement before work and open all of the doors, and when I would get home, I would check to find that pretty much all of the doors were closed when no one could have been in the house. This is all just my perspective. My friends, and roommate especially, have their own crazy stories that still get me to this day, no matter how many times I hear them. Ever since I've moved out and into a new apartment and now a trailer, I have experienced nothing at all, and it's been a nice change of pace. I honestly hope to never experience anything paranormal ever again. About three years ago, I went camping with my girlfriend, now ex, 
as she had always expressed interest but had never been. The spot we went to is in the Huron National Forest and is my go-to trail and camp spot, as it's hidden deep in the forest, and the access to the trails is close and easy for ATVs and things like that. My family has been going to this spot for about six years, and my friends introduced me about 10 years ago. We went on a weekend trip, and I'm glad we didn't go for any longer. When we got there, everything was going well, except we did notice a group of people hanging out next to our campsite. Still, they were just stargazing and ended up leaving, so it was weird, but not spooky at all. Then around midnight is when the weird stuff started to happen. At first, it sounded like someone was laughing at us, but the laugh never ended and got very high-pitched and sounded as if it just kept going. After a while, we both got kind of scared and went into the tent to try to sleep. That's when the laugh noise moved up higher and then started to circle the campsite. After a while of that happening, it just suddenly stopped, and then it started again around 3 a.m. When it started again, the fire was going out, so I went to stoke the fire with my shotgun in hand and turned on my flashlight to see if maybe I could see any coyotes or something around the campsite, but I didn't see anything or hear any movements below. This went on until 6 a.m., when it finally stopped. And that was finally when we could get some rest. After waking up, we checked the campsite and saw nothing unusual, so we packed up. Once we were packed up and good to go, I started my vehicle, which was completely dead. That really freaked me out, as I'm always paranoid about leaving things plugged in that kill the battery, and I made sure everything was closed properly and unplugged. Yet somehow, the battery still died. I got a jump from AAA. That phone call was hard to explain, and the lady who took the call didn't believe me, but in the end, we both laughed, and we did get some help. After that happened, I told my friend who had shown me the campsite, and also has a cabin in the same forest, about 25 miles away from the campsite, about what had happened, and he got really freaked out. He told me about two incidents that he's had, one at the campsite and one at his cabin. At the campsite, he stated that one night, after we'd all returned from trail riding and went to bed, he stayed up to hang out by the fire and have a few drinks. While hanging out, he was just looking off into the distance and he saw a pair of eyes up in the trees looking directly at him. He described them as bioluminescent. He flashed his high-powered flashlight at them, but there was nothing there. And as soon as the flashlight turned off, they were looking right back at him. So he packed up and went to bed. He didn't tell us because he didn't want to scare us. At the cabin, he was hanging out with his brother, and they were both just chilling by the fire outside when they saw a pair of eyes looking at them from a trail that led into the woods. They stated that at the height the eyes were looking at them, whatever it was had to be over seven feet tall. They started shooting at it with their rifles, and the eyes disappeared. But once they were done, they reappeared and were closer. At that point, they both freaked out and got back in the cabin, and they didn't leave until daylight. We have no idea what this could have been, but we all felt very scared when these events happened. After we all talked about it, one of the brothers thought that it might have been a Wendigo. I don't know what it could have been, but I haven't felt that scared before or since. Some background. I grew up in northern Michigan, about 30 miles southwest of Traverse City. 
My grandparents also lived about five minutes from where I grew up, and they have a large acreage of woods, about 117 acres. Growing up, and still to this day, they have an old golf cart, and they've created long, sprawling trails in the woods. Somewhere in the middle of the acreage is a field, about two acres, with an old sawmill. About seven years ago, when I was about 13, my sisters, nine and eight, and I decided to go on a golf cart ride through the woods on the trails. My nine-year-old sister sat up front with me, while the eight-year-old sat on the back on a mounted seat facing the opposite way. We drove up toward the field, and once we got through the trees into this area, I drove about a hundred feet in, and I saw this figure a ways ahead of me. It was probably ten feet tall and was human-shaped. Its legs dragged as it walked, and it was hunched over, and its arms looked semi-detached and dangled. Its face was a gaping black hole, but I saw what I thought was a dangling eye. My nine-year-old sister caught it too, and it began to run toward us. I whipped the cart around and sped home. My grandpa went out with a gun to the field and found nothing. I have been able to find nothing on this for years, and my sister and I are still terrified to this day. The only legend I know of from up here is a dogman, but it wasn't that. I don't know if anybody else has seen anything or experienced something similar. Maybe it was a skinwalker or a wendigo. I really don't know. When I was a child, around eight years old, I think I had an encounter. I say think, because after another experience I had later in life, it was highly probable. I lived in Lake Orion, Michigan then. The bedroom I slept in was not on the second floor, but it was higher up than the average. When you entered my house, you had to walk up three stairs to be on the main floor. So the windows were not ground level, like ordinary homes and we also had a basement. The window next to my bed was the same height as the others. Ordinary people couldn't look into the window standing on the ground. I would like to guess that it was way over six feet off the ground. One night, I woke up facing the window. My bed was pushed up right against it. It was a reasonably small room. I opened my eyes, and my eyes were looking directly at an alien. Where we lived, there wasn't any light pollution, so it was very dark outside. But the way the moon was in the sky, it must have been full or close to it. It illuminated his head, which was entirely in view, and part of his neck. He had typical features of an alien. Big black eyes, white grayish skin, and a small mouth. He had his hand resting on the window with long, thin fingers, three long and the fourth shorter. At the time, I didn't quite process his height, because I was a child. I couldn't really rationalize then. But as I grew older, I realized it had to have been very tall. I remember being very scared. I closed my eyes again, hoping it would think I didn't see it. I rolled away from the window and lay very still. I always told myself it wasn't real. I've only told a couple of close friends about it because it always sounded silly. But as I got older, I wanted to share my story.